What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about hyponatremia. Before we get started, I want you guys to please, if you guys do benefit from this video, it makes sense, it helps you, please smash that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, I really suggest this, I really think it will help. If you guys go down in the description box below, there's a link, it'll take you to our website. On our website, we have some awesome notes illustrations that I think will really help you guys to kind of follow along with me as we go through this topic together. And I hope at the end of this that you truly know and understand hyponatremia like that. So let's go ahead and get started. When we talk about hyponatremia, one of the ways that I like to learn it is I like to learn it in the way that I think is diagnostically helpful. There's a lot of different causes of hyponatremia. There's a lot of pathophysiology in hyponatremia a lot of tests that you have to run. So I like to kind of combine all of that. I like to take a lot of the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the diagnostics and kind of clump it together. And what I'll do is, is we'll go through the diagnostic steps of how to determine someone's cause of hyponatremia in a way that I hope at the end of this will make pathophysiological and etiological sense. I hope so. So let's start talking about that. So Oftentimes, does a patient generally come in with like features of hyponatremia? Like, hey doc, I got the hyponatremias. No, 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 they don't. They, oftentimes, it's asymptomatic. It's an incidental lab finding, right? So you order a patient, they get a CMP or a BMP, and it comes back and that sodium is low. Well, the question that you have to ask yourself is what is you know, a, a normal sodium? Well, generally, it's like 135 to 145. So if it's less than that kind of lower limit of normal, then it's abnormal. It's a hyponatremia. So oftentimes, that's kind of how we go about this. So if the sodium level, in any of these cases, we're going to talk about what these mean here in a second, but if the sodium is less than 135, and this can vary from lab to lab, but often it's relatively universal that 135 is the lower end of normal. So if it's less than 135, that's considered to be a hyponatremia. Now, the question that comes up here is, okay, we have a patient, maybe they're asymptomatic or they're symptomatic, and usually the symptomatics we don't see until they start really dropping down low. So like less than 120. And then you can start seeing things like seizures and cerebral edema, risk of herniation, headaches, nausea, vomiting, etc. But oftentimes when a patient comes in, they get the BMP, sodium comes back, let's say 130, mildly low. Right? So there's different levels to the lowness of the hyponatremia. So oftentimes we say that 130 to 134 is like mildly low. Then we say 120 to 129 is kind of like moderately low. And then we say like anything less than 120 is severely low. So if we have a sodium that's less than 135, the first thing that we want to figure out is, is it real? Or is it a pseudo hyponatremia? So how do I determine that? One of the first tests that I like to check for is a serum osmolality. And what the serum osmolality is going to do is it's going to tell me the tonicity of the blood. So you know sodium, sodium controls a degree of tonicity in the blood. So if sodium is low, then that would mean that the tonicity of the blood would be low because it's a factor of tonicity. So that's, that's true, right? And if that's the case, we would want to know, okay, is it somewhere between like 280 to 295? So if the serum osmolality, we're going to say in this case, I'm going to put this arrow here as um, it's going to be, you have different types, right? So say that you order a serum osmolality on a patient who has a sodium of 135. It comes back, and in this situation, let's say that the serum osmolality is really high. All right, let's say here in this situation, the serum osmolality is low. And here, the serum osmolality is normal. Okay, and that number of osmolality is usually, again, a normal number is between 280 to 295. So if it's greater than 295, let's actually just write that here, greater than 295, we would consider that a hyperosmolar or hypertonic type of solution. Well, that's kind of odd because generally, I just told you that if sodium is low, hyponatremia, that means that there's less tonicity of the blood. If there's less tonicity of the blood, it wouldn't make sense for it to be hypertonic. So what could be a cause of hypertonic hyponatremia? That means that there's something else that's present in the blood that's increasing the tonicity of the blood besides sodium. But the, but the sodium is still low. What is those things? What are those things that are actually sitting here in the blood? Let's actually represent them in this kind of like black color here. There's something else that's in the blood that's actually causing the tonicity to go up. So let's say here in this pink color, this is sodium. Here in this blue color is water. And then here we have no idea what this solute is. What are these things? That's a great question. So oftentimes it's really, really hyperosmolar kind of uh, molecules. And the different types of causes for this, I want you to think about whenever you have a hypertonic 
hyponatremia. So what is this called? This is called, let's actually write this down in this blue color here. This is a hypertonic hyponatremia. There's many different etiologies for these. The most common ones that I want you guys to remember here is going to be something like whenever the patient has extremely high glucose levels. When their glucose levels are super, super high. What are diseases by which you could see very high glucose levels? Things such as DKA, HHS, which is hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. Those would be very, very common causes, right? Another one which may be less common, but sometimes if patients are you know, having experienced what's called high intracranial pressure, they may receive something called mannitol. And mannitol is a particular molecule that's very hyperosmolar and can definitely increase the tonicity of the blood, even though the patient may have a low sodium, less than 135. So mannitol is another one. There's other things that patients are received during certain types of procedures. So if especially look in the patient's history, are they status post terp? So, so a transurethral resection of the prostate, sometimes they can use things like glycine and sorbitol, all these other different types of molecules in that type of procedure, and it can actually leak into the bloodstream and increase the tonicity of the blood, even though the sodium is less than 135. So we don't really call this a true hyponatremia. This is not a true hyponatremia. In order to be a true hyponatremia, you have to have a sodium less than 135 and your serum osmolality has to be low because that means that there's no other confounding factor or molecule in the blood that's changing the tonicity. And if it is, you have to think about these. So if I had a, for example, I get a, I get a BMP, patient sodium comes back less than 135, I throw off a serum osmolality to see if it's real because I want it to be less than 280. If it's greater than 295, that's not a true hypotonic hyponatremia, it's a hypertonic. Then I got to go looking into their, their BMP. Is their glucose really low? Check a point of care glucose. Did they receive any mannitol lately? Did they just get a terp and do they have any glycine or uh, sorbitol that they were utilized during that procedure? That might be their etiology. Another really important thing, and I really want you guys to not forget this, I'm gonna add like a little kind of asterisk next to this, is especially with glucose. I'm not gonna give you guys the formula because it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's something that you can easily look up going to MD Calc. And what you can do is whenever a patient has an extremely high glucose, which is a very common thing that you will see in practice, you need to correct the actual sodium for the high glucose. So there is a calculation that you will plug into MD Calc, and what it'll do is it'll actually take the patient's super high glucose, let's say it's like 300 something, and then they have a sodium of 132. If you plug it into this calculator, their true sodium after you correct for the hyperglycemia that's causing this tonicity to go up when it should be low, it'll actually may give you a normal sodium. So make sure you check that. Always do the sodium correction for hyperglycemia if this is a confounding factor. Okay, good there? We're gonna come back to the hypotonic in a second. Let's see if we go to this one. Okay, truly if a patient has hyponatremia and it's that, that's the thing that's actually causing the tonicity of the blood to go down, there's nothing else, then it should be hypotonic. If it's isotonic, so this would be what's called a, let's do this in blue since we did that one in blue, isotonic, hyponatremia. This is a lab error. That's the way I want you to think about this one. This is a lab error. In other words, the sodium in here, and the situation which again is the one in pink, this is the sodium, this is the water. The sodium is not really the problem. It's not that that's like super low. It's there's another molecule that's present in the blood that's altering the lab's ability to capture the true tonicity of the blood. Let's actually represent that here. So one of these molecules is lipids. If patients have extremely high amounts of lipids or if they have extremely high amounts of proteins. So in situations where patients have extremely high levels of proteins in their blood or lipids in their blood, it causes a lab error. That's the way I want you to think about this. Isotonic hyponatremia, lab error, artifactual, not real. So what are the particular causes behind this, my friends? I want you to think about things like high lipids. So if a patient has extremely high lipids in their blood, hyperlipidemia, that's one particular cause. Maybe check a lipid panel, especially if you get a sodium less than 135 and a serum osmolality of, we did that in like this maroon, let's keep this in maroon. It's gonna be somewhere between 280 to 295. So it's gonna be in that normal range of the tonicity. If lipids are a factor, check the lipids, look at their history. Also, proteins, so high amounts of proteins. There's so many diseases. So think about multiple 
myeloma, oh, that's a big one. Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, oh, that's a son of a gun, isn't it? So Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, multiple myeloma. There's even another situation here, which you can even see if a patient just recently got IVIG. IVIG is an antibody, it's a protein. So look in their history. Did they recently receive any IV IG therapies? And boom, you'll elicit right from the get-go. A patient comes back, they have a serum sodium that's less than 135. You say, okay, they may have hyponatremia. What do I do? Send off a serum osms. In a theoretical world, perfect kind of world, if sodium is the primary problem where it's there and it's low, it'll drop the tendency to the blood, hypotonic hyponatremia. If it's hypertonic, so the tendency is high, there's something else that's increasing it, glucose, mannitol, sometimes even urea, if patients take urea, as well as other things such as if they just got a terp like glycine and sorbitol. Okay, if that's the case, that's a hypertonic hyponatremia, that's a pseudo, that's not real. If you check it and the actual tonicity is normal, again, it shouldn't be normal, it shouldn't be high, it shouldn't be normal, it should be low. There's something else, there's a lab error, there's an artifactual problem here. And that is usually due to lots of lipids and lots of protein. So check their lipid panel and check for maybe an electrophoresis or diagnose them with multiple myeloma, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, check to see if they got any recent IVIG. Now if the real situation comes up where the patient actually has a serum osms that's checked, and when their serum osm is checked, it's actually between what? It's not greater than 295. It's not between 280 and 295. It's less than 280. So this is a hypotonic hyponatremia. This is where the money is, my friends. And this is where we'll be focusing on the most of our lecture. So in this point, it is hypotonic hyponatremia. And in this point here, we're gonna move on to many different causes. And this is the true causes of hyponatremia. So once we get to this point here, where we've determined that the patient has a hypotonic hyponatremia, I'm gonna move on to the next test, okay? So I hope that part of this kind of like lecture made sense, where we start off, we check a patient's sodium, Okay, and, and also again, you're gonna find a very important point out of all of this, that when patients have, again, a sodium less than 135, the most common causes of a true hypotonic hyponatremia is where they have a dilutional effect. There's lots of water, more water, these kind of molecules here, in their blood than there is sodium. Do you notice that? How in these ones, it was pretty normal. They were pretty close. So there wasn't a true differentiating difference between sodium and water in the hypertonic or isotonic hyponatremia. It was the other molecules that were present that were changing the tonicity. In true hypotonic hyponatremia, do you notice the difference here? Look at the amount of sodium molecules I have, less than the amount of water molecules. Oftentimes, this is the true cause. And how do we figure that out? Well, we do something called checking about if the ADH is on or if the ADH is off. Let's get into talking about that. All right, my friends, so now we gotta talk about hypotonic hyponatremia. So we went in, we checked the BMP, maybe they were symptomatic, they were having seizures, cerebral edema features, or they were asymptomatic, and we just ordered some routine lab work. Sodium came back less than 135, okay? And again, we have the mild, moderate, and severe. Again, just to remind you, 130 to 134, mild, okay? 120 to 129, eh, it's like moderate. And then if we get all the way down to less than 120, that's pretty severe. That's when you start seeing symptoms. But either way, we got this hyponatremia. We check the serum osmolality to see if it's a true hypotonic hyponatremia, meaning that the sodium being low is the problem of changing the tonicity of the blood. If it's high, that means that there's a lot of some other kind of like tonic molecule in the blood that's increasing the tonicity. Things like glucose, mannitol, or things after a terp like sorbitol and glycine. If it's normal tonicity, that means that this is a lab or artifactual type of problem. And this is such as high lipids, high proteins that you see in things like multiple myeloma, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and IVIG therapy. But if we get it and it's actually less than 280, that means that this is a true hypotonic hyponatremia. And that means that there's very little sodium and it may be an increase in the relative amount of water within the body. But either way, there's gonna be more water in the body than there is gonna be sodium. All right. Now that leads us to the next thing. Whenever a patient develops these kind of hyponatremia problems, oftentimes the cause, the source of it, the most common cause is that the ADH levels are pumped up through the roof. So oftentimes the most common cause here is that the patient has very high 
ADH levels. And then there's very little causes, only a few, where the ADH is either, we're actually just gonna use an X, the ADH is off, okay? So it's either the ADH is on or the ADH is off. And if you wanted to, just to make it a little bit easier here, is that the ADH is like really low. We're, have, we're producing very little ADH, just so we keep the arrows kind of the same here. All right, so that leads to the question then, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, what stimulates it? What's causing it to be produced? Because if I know what's causing ADH to be produced, I know what the causes are, and then I can evaluate those causes, right? So that's where we got to get into. All right, so ADH has a couple different stimulatory factors. Let's use this marker to kind of highlight those factors. So first we know that the ADH is produced by what? So you have neurons in your hypothalamus, and they're kind of extending down to the posterior pituitary. And they release a particular molecule here called ADH. What's another name for ADH, just in case different textbooks say this? Vasopressin, just remember that. Another name is vasopressin. So ADH is produced by the posterior pituitary. But we gotta know what's the trigger that makes ADH be produced that goes down to the kidneys and produces this type of change. That's the important question. Okay, that's the million dollar question. The stimulatory factors, the stimulatory factors of ADH is what? Well, one of them is going to be hypovolemia. Now, here's the thing. When a patient is very volume down, hypovolemic, there's different ways that we can look at this. Um, sometimes when you're very, very hypovolemic, the amount of water that you have within the body and the amount of sodium within your body is, gets really low, and it changes the plasma osmolality. Oftentimes, we would say that the plasma osmolality in a hypotonic hyponatremia patient is low, right? So that would mean that there's more water than there is sodium. But we have to figure out how we got to that point. How did the patient get to that point where there was maybe a little bit more water than there was sodium? It's because of ADH. Well, something had to stimulate ADH to just kind of turn on. And one of the reasons is that the patient is volume depleted. We'll use down arrows. That they're volume down. If the patient is volume down or volume depleted, that tells ADH, hey, ADH, you better get stimulated and start producing some kind of you know, important effect here. Well, then ADH then says, don't worry, bro, I got you. And ADH runs down here to the kidneys and it gets to the collecting duct. When it gets into the collecting ducts, it binds onto these vasopressin receptors. You know, these, these are V2 receptors, vasopressin receptors. And what it does is, we're not gonna go through the whole mechanism, but it stimulates the production of a G protein pathway, which activates and stimulates these special blue channels here. What are these channels? These are aquaporins. Aquaporin two and four get activated. Now normally what happens is, what happens is your body tries to go into this interesting mode. So normally when you're hypovolemic, your kidneys, let's say that they just didn't care about hypovolemia, ADH wasn't even present. You would just continue to pee out a certain amount of volume and you wouldn't try to retain any of that volume and you get more hypovolemic. Well, since ADH is on, what happens is all these water molecules that are then flowing through the kidney tubules, they're about to get peed out. They're like, wee, going to the toilet. And then all of a sudden it gets to the collecting duct. Collecting duct says, he says, uh-uh, you ain't going to the toilet. Y'all better not be in that toilet. And then what it does is it pulls this water through the aquaporin units. And then when it pulls the water through the aquaporin units, it pulls this water right into the bloodstream. And so you reabsorb a very large amount of water. So what's gonna happen here? You're going to reabsorb a very large amount of water because your problem was that you were volume depleted. If I bring a lot of water into the actual bloodstream, I'm going to replete my volume status. But what it does is, is it increases the amount of water molecules, then it does the sodium molecules, and then it starts to deplete this out. And then if you get this type of effect, what is this called, my friends? Hyponatremia. So then the overarching theme out of this is that this may trigger a low sodium. Woo, we good. All right, but here's the other thing. Here's the other factor then. If ADH is on and it works in the kidneys to reabsorb water, lots and lots of water, that means that the water that was supposed to go into the PP did not go into the PP. And that means that you're gonna have very little water and instead you're gonna have a lot of other things in here. So you might have some sodium in here, you might have some potassium in here, you might have some urea in here, lots of other solute molecules that change the osmolality in the urine. 
So we know the serum osmolality in this situation here. So if we were to think about this one, we already know that the serum osmolality was low. Why is it low? Because there's more water than there is sodium. There's less tonicity. <clears throat> well, what about here? Now there's lots of things like sodium, water, I'm sorry, sodium, potassium, lots of urea, a bunch of different metabolites, but then what about water? Very little water. So now what's gonna happen to the urine osmolality? It's gonna be very high. So isn't that a very interesting thing? So that we say here, when ADH, <clears throat> when ADH is really, really high, let's actually do it like this, when ADH is on, if you will, or it's very high because there's a volume depletion problem, then what does that do to the urine osmolality? What does it do to it? It increases the urine osmolality because you have less water and lots of salt, lots of potassium, lots of chloride, lots of urea, lots of solute molecules here that increase the tonicity. To what point? Greater than 300 is what we usually utilize. There's a various, various numbers, right? So sometimes we even just say greater than 100, but oftentimes for it to be truly like high, we say greater than 300. Now that's that situation. Okay, well before we keep going on, we know that that's one effect of the ADH. So one effect of the ADH and the most profound effect on the ADH is that it is going to try to increase the reabsorption of water, right? But you know what else it does? It's really cool. ADH is a very smart son of a gun. It tells the hypothalamus, it says, hey hypothalamus, I want you to stimulate an increase in thirst. I want you to cause the patient to become more thirsty, have an increased desire to drink fluids. And so then if they drink more fluids, what are they gonna do? So then now, here's the second effect. The second effect here is that I'm going to increase the consumption of water. I'm gonna increase my thirst mechanism. And if I increase my thirst mechanism, I'm going to have more water running through my GIT. If I have more water running through my GIT, I reabsorb more water across the GIT. Because if I'm drinking more, I'm going to absorb more of that water into my GIT, increase the water amount in my bloodstream to replete my volume, but then I dilute out my sodium, causing a hyponatremia. Isn't that a cool concept there? So there's two effects of ADH. One is it causes reabsorption of water across the kidneys so you retain more fluid, don't pee it out. And the other one is it makes you thirsty so that you drink more water to replete your volume. <laughs> that's so cool. All right, well, that's, that's the mechanisms there. But you know, that's not the only thing. Another very powerful stimulating factor of ADH is when you have, this term can be sometimes like loosely utilized. I like to just use it as a term of blood pressure, cardiac output, but Oftentimes when a patient's effective arterial blood volume, you may use hear this term a lot in this situation. I like to just think about this as BP. Their BP is on the lower end, their cardiac output. So let's actually put, let's put both of those factors there. So their cardiac output or their blood pressure is on the lower end. They're not circulating as much volume through their blood vessels, so the amount of volume in their blood vessels is less. They're not truly in a volume depleted state. They, they're actually hypervolemic, some of these patients who have a decreased effective arterial blood volume. It's just the amount of volume that's supposed to be in their blood vessels is leaked into other areas. It's in their tissue spaces, it's in their lungs, it's in their legs, it, it's in their abdomen. So a lot of these problems is that the fluid is not within their vessels, which actually controls their volume, their blood pressure. And so their blood pressure gets lower. Well, if that happens, ADH gets stimulated, increases the reabsorption of water, causes you to become thirsty. Let's actually put this blue arrow over here. Causes you to become thirsty, increase the reabsorption of water across uh, absorption of water across the GIT. And you know what else it does? It binds onto it binds onto these vasopressin 1 receptors. So these are V1 receptors. And when it acts on the V1 receptors, it stimulates these puppies and causes the blood vessel to vasoconstrict. Some of you guys, if you guys have heard of this, there is a drug that we give to patients when they are uh, hypotensive and their blood pressure is low. Guess what that drug is? Vasopressin. Guess what vasopressin is? ADH. So do realize that the ADH at higher concentrations can have a very strong vasoconstrictive effect. And so what it can do is it can actually cause vasoconstriction. And that will increase your blood pressure. 
because one of the problems is that the patient's blood pressure is on the lower end, their cardiac output's on the lower end, their effective arterial blood volume's on the lower end, I can do a couple things. One is I can strict their blood vessels to increase the blood pressure, and I can actually pull more water into the bloodstream. And if I increase the amount of blood volume, I theoretically increase my blood pressure. So you understand how these mechanisms are working, right? There's one more etiology or one more trigger here. And the last trigger here is actually what's called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is a very powerful stimulator. And you can see this on a lot of different triggers. Sometimes if a patient isn't perfusing their kidneys very well, so they're not getting a lot of blood pressure or perfusion to the kidneys, that'll trigger the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Sometimes in other situations where their GFR may be affected or they have a lower GFR, that may trigger the actual renin angiotensin aldosterone system. If the sympathetic nervous system becomes activated, that can trigger the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. There's many different things. But the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, more specifically, more specifically, angiotensin 2 is a very powerful stimulator of ADH. And whenever that happens, what ADH will do is It'll increase water reabsorption. It'll increase the absorption across the GIT because you're thirsty. And it'll increase your blood pressure. All of these things are trying to get more volume, more circulating volume within the actual bloodstream to perfuse the kidneys better or to increase the patient's blood pressure. So oftentimes, whenever a patient's volume depleted or their effective arterial blood volume is low, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is also generally activated. But these are the three primary triggers that turn the ADH on. So that begs the question then, what are causes of volume depletion? What are causes of a low effective arterial blood volume? What are causes of like this inactive, uh, this activated renin angiotensin aldosterone system? Well, there's many different causes here, my friends. So I'm not gonna go through them all because we're gonna talk about them in a little bit, but some of the things that I would want you guys to think about is when a patient is extremely volume depleted, they're losing volume from the body. This could be in situations such as vomiting, this could be in situations such as diarrhea. This could be if they're, I mean, theoretically, if you really think about it, it could be bleeding, if they're truly bleeding. This could be in situations such as um, uh, pancreatitis as well. So sometimes pancreatitis can cause a lot of third spacing of fluids into the interstitial spaces. This could be things like you're actually giving them medications that cause them to pee a lot. So diuretics could definitely be a cause. You can even see this in conditions such as cerebral salt wasting. And you know what else? Another one is basically whenever they have um, alterations within the amount of aldosterone. Uh, and so sometimes you can see this in situations such as um, uh, Addison's disease. So whenever they're not producing a lot of aldosterone. So there's things like that where their volume down is the problem. Another issue is that what if it's the low effective arterial blood volume? So what if it's the effective arterial blood volume or the cardiac outputs that, that it's really low and that's the problem? Well, this could be things like CHF, right? Where a patient isn't circulating a lot of blood because their heart isn't pumping very well. Or it could be in things like cirrhosis, or you can see this in things like nephrotic syndrome. And sometimes in these particular diseases, what happens is they have a lack of albumin, and so it causes a lot of water to actually kind of like leak from their vasculature. And so their true amount of volume that's present within their vasculature is lower because they're leaking some of it out because they don't have the albumin to hold that into the vessels, which is kind of a cool concept. We'll talk a little bit later. There is one other trigger for which ADH is turned on, but it's not due to a volume depletion. It's not due to an effective arterial blood volume problem. It's not due to an alteration of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It's actually something where there's an inappropriate production of ADH. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, let's come to the last thing here, where ADH is actually off. This is the weird ones. They're the cool ones, but they're the weird ones. And so oftentimes, the causes behind someone having less ADH would do what? Well, let's think about this. If you don't produce ADH, <clears throat> are you gonna squeeze the blood vessels? No. So they're not gonna have as much of a vasoconstrictive effect. Their BP won't kind of increase as a result of that. Are you gonna have as much of a thirst mechanism, theoretically, to drink a lot of water? Maybe not, maybe not. So you might not be absorbing a lot of water across the GIT. Okay, well here's the big thing, and this is one of the coolest parts of this to be able to differentiate if it's a patient's hyponatremia ADH dependent, meaning it's on, or is it ADH independent, is it off?
If ADH is off or it's not being produced a lot, will it act on the V2 receptors in the kidney and the collecting duct? No. Will you reabsorb water across the, uh, you know, the collecting duct? No. If I don't reabsorb water across the collecting duct, will I have a lot of water present then in my urine? Yes, I will. Because ADH isn't on, it's not pulling a lot of this water across. So in this situation here, my friends, where ADH is off, if you will, where ADH is off, we're gonna use the down arrows, and we like to say, theoretically, when the urine osmolality is on the lower end, so we like to use the number less than 100. That's why I was saying, if technically if it's greater than 100, it's technically, you could say the urine osmolality is on the higher end, but we like to go with the upper end, greater than 300. So this can vary from textbook to textbook, uh, though. Remember that. But in this situation, right away, I can tell if this is the cause. So I check the serum osmolality to figure out if it's a hypotonic hyponatremia. Is it real? Okay, that's what I told you before. Sodium's less than 135. Check the serum osmolality. If it's high, it's not real. It's glucose, mannitol, things after a terp. If it's normal, not real. It's things like high lipids and high proteins, artifactual lab adder. If it is less than one, uh, 280, okay, uh, this is a real hypotonic hyponatremia. Okay, well then I need to determine, is the ADH on? Because then this is all the causes of ADH are on. That's a lot of them. Or is the ADH off? And that's very little causes, and that's actually really easy to, 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 to differentiate. Well, check the urine osmolality. If the urine osmolality is really high, I'm, I'm resorbing, reabsorbing and pulling a lot of water across my kidneys back into the bloodstream. And that means ADH is on. If I'm not pulling a lot of water across my kidneys into the bloodstream, and I'm peeing a lot of that water out, that means ADH is off. And if ADH is off, there's not a ton of causes. Thank the Lord for that. And the primary things that I want you to remember without getting too complicated, because we don't know a ton of the pathophysiology behind this, is this could be things like primary, polydipsia. They used to call this psychogenic polydipsia, but I don't think that they liked what we call it our patient psycho. Um, so primary polydipsia also is sometimes referred to as psychogenic polydipsia. Another one is called the tea and toast diet the tea and toast diet. Another one, which believe it or not, can be sometimes relatively common in our society, uh, beer potomania. And then one last one is severe end-stage renal disease. Oftentimes, these patients are likely on hemodialysis, okay, of some type. They're likely on dialysis. So you'll see these as the particular etiologies if the ADH is low. And uh, that would be something that you can kind of sift out from the patient just by history and talking to them a little bit. You could sift that out. But then again, check that urine, urine awesomes. It doesn't leave you with as many causes because I didn't even list all the causes here. This is a plethora of causes that we're going to have to investigate. So if you get the ADH is low and the urine osmolality is very low, it leads you to these. And this is often history that will elucidate this. And that's it. All right. So we've gone through. We've said, okay, the patient has hyponatremia. I checked the serum osmolality to figure out if it's real. I checked the uh, urine osmolality to see if ADH is on or ADH is off. And that determines the different types of causes. Now, the next thing is, is how in the world am I supposed to figure out out of all of these which one it is? And if it's all of these, you said history, Zach. I'll go into this through a little bit more detail. But Zach, can you truly please explain to me in a couple ways, the pathophysiology of how these things cause ADH to be produced in high levels, how I can differentiate these from one another, and is there a volume way that I can determine this? And Zach, you also didn't mention the inappropriate ADH production. Can you mention that as well? I got you, fam. Let's go talk about that. All right, my friends, so now we've gotten to the point where now we know, okay, the patient has an ADH-dependent hyponatremia, meaning ADH is on. It's really, really highly elevated. So something is causing a volume depletion problem. Something's causing an increased effect, of, uh, sorry, a decreased effect of arterial blood volume, where they're not having a good cardiac output or blood pressure that's adequate to be able to generate this. Or there's an you know, undesirable activation of the renangiotensin aldosterone system or a desirable one that's causing a lot of this ADH to be produced in high amounts, reabsorbing lots of water across the kidneys. And if it is, it's increasing the amount of water in the bloodstream, decreasing the amount of water into the urine. So it increase, it does what? It increases the urine osmolality and decreases the serum osmolality, right? That's for ADH dependent ones. Now, we have to then go and say, okay, if the patient is volume depleted, what could be the causes behind volume depletion? 
And again, is, can you explain just a little bit more, Zach, maybe about how it causes some hyponatremia um, and other factors? So the first one that I want you to think about, so let's think about if the patient is volume depleted, right? So the patient is volume down. So whenever the patient is volume down, that means that the amount of sodium within their body, the amount of water within their body are both depleted. Okay, that's really important to remember. So when we talk about this, the pink is representing the sodium, right? So in this situation, the amount of sodium within their body is depleted, and the amount of water within their body is depleted. But which one's depleted more? Sodium is depleted more. Okay, so when this happens, we have to think about the patient is losing volume from their body, but they tend to be losing a little bit more sodium in their, their volume losses than they are losing water. And then ADH gets turned on because they're volume depleted, they reabsorb a lot of water, and if they reabsorb a lot of water, they dilute their sodium even more. So here, let's think about those causes. So the way that I like to think about this is if it's a renal cause or an extra renal cause. Don't worry, you're like, why? I'll explain a little bit. It has to do with another test that we can order called a urine sodium. We'll get to that in a second. But for renal causes, there's a couple different reasons why this can happen. So one of these that I want you guys to think about here is if a patient is taking something called a diuretic. So if a patient is taking what's called a loop diuretic, this could be one potential etiology. And let me explain why. It's not as common if you're taking this very consistently. So loop diuretics intrinsically, if it's like a couple time usage, they don't cause like true hypo, they can cause hyponatremia, but it's not as severe as the next diuretic that we'll talk about. But if a patient is taking a diuretic, loop diuretics do have the possibility of causing hyponatremia. So let's actually put that as like a category here as the first etiology for volume losses from the kidney, where you're losing volume, sodium and water from the kidneys. So this could be due to diuretic usage. Now when we talk about these diuretics, the first one that I want you to remember is the loop diuretic. So this is things like furosemide, torsemide, bumetanide, ethacrinic acid. What they do is they inhibit the sodium chloride, sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter. You can't reabsorb sodium. All right, that's inhibited. So sodium stays here in the tubules, and then you lose lots of sodium into the urine. So lots of sodium loss are going to occur here. But then what else is gonna follow this? Especially if you're doing this pretty consistently. What's gonna follow, because you didn't reabsorb it here in the descending limit of the loop of Henle, because that's the countercurrent multiplier mechanism. When sodium gets pushed out here, water likes to leave. That won't happen. So water stays within the kidney tubules, and it also, my friends, get lost into the urine. So you're losing sodium and you're losing water. You just happen to lose a little bit more sodium than you do water. But you're losing a lot of sodium in your urine. So if you're losing, the amount of sodium within your urine is very, very high. What does that do to the urine sodium? It increases it. So if the urine sodium goes up, if the urine sodium is really, really high, that tells me that that's a renal loss. And that's one of the causes, loop diuretics. Hmm, interesting. Okay, let's go to the next one. What if someone is taking uh, what's called a thiazide diuretic? So a thiazide diuretic is another one. And if they're taking a thiazide diuretic, that that inhibits this sodium chloride cotransporter in the early distal convoluted tubule. And that means that sodium will not be able to be absorbed in this part. And then subsequently, you won't be able to reabsorb any water as well, right? So you'll lose sodium and water into the urine. And if you lose lots of sodium in your urine, what's gonna happen to your urine sodium? Oh my gosh, it's gonna go up. Let's actually, just to highlight this again, the urine sodium is gonna go up. Well, that's interesting. That's another test that I could order. Hmm, okay, let's see if a lot of other diseases that are within the renal volume loss have this high urine sodium. <laughs> okay, the next problem here is we're volume depleted and it's because of diuretics. Huh. What if, what if, what if I actually didn't produce a lot of aldosterone? Okay, well that's an interesting concept. What if the problem here is low aldosterone? So it's low aldosterone. Well, if I don't produce a lot of aldosterone, very low levels of aldosterone, what does aldosterone do? Oh yeah, aldosterone works over here, and what aldosterone does is it actually stimulates a lot of different pumps, like the sodium, the ENAC ch channels, 
It also stimulates the potassium channels. It also stimulates the formation of the sodium potassium ATPases, all of those things. And so what it's supposed to do is, is it's actually supposed to help you with the reabsorption of sodium. That's what it's supposed to do, right? Just like, just like the thighs, eyes, and just like the um, loop diuretics, you're blocking the sodium reabsorption. Well, if I have low aldosterone, am I going to be able to stimulate the sodium transporters to be formed? Am I going to be able to stimulate the sodium potassium pumps that I can reabsorb the sodium? No. So because I have low levels of aldosterone, low levels of aldosterone, I'm not going to be able to stimulate all these channels. And so because of that, I'm going to inhibit these channels. Can I absorb sodium? No. And can I excrete potassium? No. So then I lose a lot of that sodium in the urine and then some water loss as well. So low aldosterone could be due to an actual like Addison's disease. That could be one particular problem. You know what another one is? We, we think it actually may be related to this. It also may be related to a problem with um, the sympathetic nervous system regulation of the kidneys as well. But there's one other disease that may be related to low aldosterone because one of the treatments for it is actually aldosterone. Um, and this is specifically called cerebral salt wasting. It's a very common disease that I see a lot in my patients who have subarachnoid hemorrhages, a lot of the times. And so there's a large, like actual trauma, a lot of like problems that actually occur intracranially that may trigger this low aldosterone production and may lead to a lot of sodium wasting into the urine. So their urine sodium is gonna go through the roof. And again, with all of these situations, you're supposed to be reabsorbing water with the sodium. So you lose sodium and you also lose some degree of water, but not as much as the sodium loss. And that's why the patient's total sodium is much less than their total water balance, okay? Now, these are the theoretical problems that I want you guys to be thinking about with this. Is there any other kind of renal losses? These are the primary ones that I really want you guys to remember. So I want you to think about loop diuretics, thighs diuretics, problems that cause a reduction in aldosterone, such as Addison's disease, cerebral salt wasting problems. These are the big things. There is one more um, type of problem here where you also could see this. Generally, it's kind of a treatment process. As it's, uh, sometimes you can actually see this with uh, uh, other diseases, but we're not gonna go through that as much here. We're gonna talk about primarily, these are the primary renal problems that I want you to remember. All right, so that's the first thing. So now we check a urine sodium. If the urine sodium is high, it then tells me that this is a renal loss. That's what I want you to associate this with. If the urine sodium comes back really high, I want you to say, okay, then it is a renal loss. And if it's a renal loss, then the next thing I want you to think about here is, if it's a renal loss, then I want you to think, is it due to diuretics or is it due to low aldosterone? Okay, so we've gone through sodium slow, Check the serum osms, see if that's low. Check the urine osms. If the urine osms is high, that means ADH is on. If ADH is on, check the urine sodium. If the urine sodium is high, that means that the person is losing volume, but it's losing it from their kidneys. Think about diuretic usage and think about a low aldosterone. All right, so let's say that you kind of go through this, you go through the history, you're not able to completely elucidate if it's diuretic related or if it's low aldosterone related. Generally, history should be good enough, but if it isn't, think about this. With diuretics, what does it do to your electrolytes? It kind of alters some of your electrolytes, yeah? So it definitely does alter your electrolytes versus aldosterone that also alters some of your electrolytes and your acid-base balance as well. So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about two different molecules, potassium and then pH. With diuretics, what does it do to the potassium? It causes potassium wasting. So we know that loop diuretics, thiazide diuretics, and even um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors diuretics, they, also cause, they all cause potassium wasting. Well, if that's the case, then loop diuretics and thiazide diuretics are gonna cause low potassium within the blood. That's gonna be low. Whereas low aldosterone, what did aldosterone do? It inhibited the actual potassium pumps. So remember, aldosterone, low aldosterone leads to inhibiting the ENAC channel so you don't absorb sodium, so sodium gets lost into the urine. Urine sodium is high. It also inhibits potassium excretion. So you don't, you don't actually excrete potassium, so potassium goes up, right? So in that situation, aldosterone, the potassium should go up. Okay, diuretics, they actually cause a lot of bicarb loss and proton loss, I'm sorry, they actually cause proton losses into the urine. So since they cause proton loss into the urine, what will they do to the actual pH? They'll cause a metabolic alkalosis. So they will cause a metabolic alkalosis because they cause 
proton loss. Now, with the actual low aldosterone, they're responsible. Aldosterone normally stimulates proton excretion. If you have less aldosterone, can you excrete protons? No. So the protons build up within the body, build up within the blood and cause metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. Okay, my friends. All right, so the next thing here is, we talked about the volume depletion causes from a renal point of view. What about the volume depletion causes from an extra renal point of view? So in this situation here, we now go on to talking about, okay, it's not the kidneys that are responsible for losing the sodium in the water, it's something else that's causing this. So what if the patient is losing sodium and water not from the kidneys, they're losing it from other sources? So in other words, they're losing blood. Again, not as common, but something to consider. Bleeding, that would definitely be one that I would wanna keep on my list. So bleeding would be definitely one. Okay, so let's add that one in. What about if they're losing tons of sodium and water from their actual skin, burns, excessive sweating. So that would be another one. So if a patient has very, very intense burns or sweating, really, really bad sweating, this can also be potential triggers. So lots of burns, lots of bleeding, that could be one. Another one, <laughs> what if they're losing lots of sodium from their upper GI tract and their lower GI tract? So they're having lots of vomiting or they're having lots of diarrhea. These could also be potential triggers. And the last one I told you, this is an interesting one, where the pancreas becomes so inflamed, it releases a lot of like systemic mediator molecules that cause inflammation, causes vasodilation, leakage of fluid out of the actual capillaries and into the interstitial spaces. You can see this in pancreatitis. So you could also see this in pancreatitis. Now, my next thing that I want you guys to think about is, okay, this is an extra renal loss. Well, Zach said that the renal losses cause urine sodium loss, okay? Well, in this situation, you're not gonna see a lot of urine sodium loss then, theoretically, right? Absolutely. There's one exception, that's vomiting. I'll briefly explain it. But for the most part, in all of these, you're gonna see primarily no excessive loss of urine sodium. So how do I determine that? Okay. In these situation here, the kidneys are working. Okay, no transporters in the ascending limit loop of Henle, the early distal convoluted tubule, none of the problems with aldosterone are present. So the kidneys are intact. In other words, they're reabsorbing sodium here. There's no loop diuretic inhibiting this, right? So sodium is, is being reabsorbed here. Sodium is being reabsorbed here. Sodium is being reabsorbed here. There's no defects within loop diuretics or low aldosterone that's the problem here, okay? And so because of that, you're not losing a ton of sodium in the actual urine. That's one particular thing. But here's, here's another th thought process, is that all of these things, such as bleeding, burns, sweating, vomiting, pancreatitis, they cause volume depletion. When you cause volume depletion, what does that do to the ADH? What does it do to the ADH? It increases the ADH presence. And ADH will then stimulate water reabsorption. Right? So the problem here is that you're not really going to be having a lot of sodium loss that's actually gonna be present within the urine because you're reabsorbing sodium perfectly in all of these places that you weren't when it came to diuretics or low aldosterone. So in this situation, what happens to the urine sodium? The urine sodium is going to be what, my friends? It should be on the lower end. It should be on the lower end. And again, these numbers can vary from textbook to textbook. Sometimes they say like a urine sodium greater than like 20. Sometimes they'll say 40, a urine sodium less than 20. So it obviously varies from textbook to textbook. I'll just say from the textbook that I got, usually we say urine sodium greater than 20, and then a urine sodium less than 20 would be considered that lower end. Oftentimes we may go a little bit higher for this one and go up to 40. But that's the concept that I want you guys to understand here, is that in these particular etiologies, they're not altering the effect of the reabsorption of sodium. The kidneys are intact, they're working. They're reabsorbing sodium fine. And they're even reabsorbing some of the water. So again, this affects the dilutional effect of the blood, right? So then if you look at the bloodstream out of this, you're gonna have, again, the problem here is that you're losing sodium from all of these other sources. Your kidneys are doing the best they can to reabsorb some sodium, but they're reabsorbing a lot of water. And so then again, when you look at this, 
you're losing lots of sodium from bleeding, burns, sweating, pancreatitis, diarrhea, vomiting. But then your kidneys are on, trying their best to reabsorb some sodium, but it's not gonna be enough, but they are reabsorbing a lot of water. And then again, what is the effect here? Hyponatremia. Now, another thing that obviously you could do here is if a patient's bleeding, figure out their bleeding source. So obviously scan them, look for them, do a fast exam, try to find out where the bleeding is coming from. If they're sweating, that's obviously pretty obvious. If they have burns on their body, that's pretty obvious. Vomiting, again, history. But if you really wanna go the route that sometimes they may ask in the exam potentially, is that vomiting causes a lot of proton losses. So what would that do to the pH of the body? It would cause a metabolic alkalosis. So again, think about that. Think about checking for a metabolic alkalosis. Whereas with diarrhea, you're losing a lot of bicarbonate in the actual poo. And if you're losing a lot of bicarbonate, what does that do to the pH? It drops the pH and causes a metabolic acidosis. And so check for a metabolic acidosis. So these are the things that I really want you guys to think about when it comes to the source of, again, why is the ADH on? Is it on because you're losing volume from the body? And that excessive loss of volume is causing ADH to be turned on and to reabsorb a lot of water across the kidneys, the GIT, and to get your water volume to come up in the body, depleting the sodium causing hyponatremia. If that is the case, what's the cause of the actual volume loss? Is it because your kidneys are peeing out tons of sodium and water? If it is, think about diuretics and low aldosterone. Check the urine sodium because they're peeing out a lot of sodium. If the kidneys are intact, there's no kind of drugs or low aldosterone that's causing a problem here, and it's an extra renal sodium water loss, then think about bleeding, burns, excessive amount of sweating from fevers, or also losses from the GIT, vomiting, excessive NG tube suction, as well as diarrhea, and then the other one, pancreatitis. Now I did mention really quickly that vomiting has a little slight exception to it. I'll put a little asterisk next to it. That vomiting causes a metabolic alkalosis as compared to diarrhea, which causes a metabolic acidosis. When patients develop a metabolic alkalosis, one of the ways that their body tries to compensate is their kidneys try their best to excrete what? To excrete bicarbonate. And so one of the things that happens here is the actual vomiting will try to cause It'll try to stimulate the kidneys to pee out bicarbonate. But you know what happens when you try to pee out bicarb? To try to improve, so you're trying to pee out a lot of bicarb. And if you try to pee out a lot of bicarb, that'll try to actually help to bring the pH back down. Because if you're losing base, then you're actually gonna cause the pH to come down. But you know what else happens whenever you actually have this process? Whenever you excrete bicarb, guess what unfortunately you excrete it with? Sodium. And so sometimes as a result, the sodium may be a little bit elevated because it's a compensation mechanism to the metabolic alkalosis. So do be careful with this one on the exam. Yes, vomiting is an extra renal loss. You lose a lot of sodium and you lose a lot of water from vomiting. That's the source. But their urine sodium is one of the few exceptions where it may not be low. And the reason why is they have a metabolic alkalosis, their kidneys compensate by causing them to excrete bicarb. When they excrete bicarb, they also excrete sodium. So this is the only exception to the extra renal ones that you could potentially see in the exam that I don't want you to forget. Okay, that covers the volume down problem. Now, we go to the next situation, which is what if the patient is volume up? All right, my friends, so the next situation is if the patient's volume is super up. All right, and now this may seem a little odd. So the patient is volume up, Zach. I thought that you know the patient has to be volume depleted, and that's one of the stimulators of ADH production. If ADH is produced, it'll you know that'll cause one of the factors of hyponatremia. We, we talked about that, yeah. Well, here's the weird thing. I use the term low effective arterial blood volume, right? I use that term in, a, in another way. Here's what I want you to think about. When you hear of a patient who is hypervolemic, this is often the patient population of a low effective arterial blood volume. So that's the other way that I want you to remember that. So I'm gonna write that down here, like on the side here is, I also want you to associate this as being the low effective arterial blood volume, or that low cardiac output, kind of low blood pressure state, right? Really, really important. Now, when a patient is hypervolemic, okay, 
We'll talk about what that looks like. And we'll even talk about what like a volume depleted or volume down patient will look like, like on the physical exam, things that they could ask you that also help you to point to which one of these it may be which can be a very challenging thing uh, in, in the actual true reality. But we'll, I'll give you guys some tips. But in a patient who is volume up or hypervolemic, it's a very interesting patient population. So in this situation, their total like sodium, <clears throat> believe it or not, their total body sodium may actually be just a little bit elevated. So in this patient population, and you're like, wait, 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 Zach, what? Yeah, I know, just go hang with me for a second. Their total body sodium may be a little bit elevated than the normal patient, but their total body water is through the roof. Now that includes what? Now remember, when I talk about this, like, I'm not just talking about it within the vasculature. I'm talking about this within the actual interstitial space because you're saying, Zach, there's a lot of water in their, 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 their actual vessels. It could be, but oftentimes the effect of arterial blood volume, their cardiac output, their blood pressure is on the lower end. Some of this water may not only be in the blood vessel. Some of this water may be in the interstitial spaces. Some of this water may be in the cells. So when we talk about total body water, I'm talking about the water in their extracellular fluid, which means their vascular space, and then the interstitial space, as well as in the intracellular compartment. These patients tend to have a lot of like water in all of these compartments. And their sodium may even be a little bit elevated because they have a little bit of sodium here, some sodium here, and some sodium there. Okay, that's an important concept to remember. But again, we first said, if it's ADH dependent, it's volume down or it's a low effective arterial blood volume. These are also the patients who tend to be hypervolemic appearing. And I'll explain what that means because this is usually referring to volume status. And that's a way that we can examine them. If we think that this patient is volume hypervolemic, meaning that they have a low effective arterial blood volume or cardiac output or blood pressure, then what are the potential causes? I told you it could be CHF, it could be something called cirrhosis, or it could be something called nephrotic syndrome. Let's explain that for a second. Now, in the patient who has CHF, right, so they have congestive heart failure, this is usually seen, you can see this in diastolic heart failure, you can see this in systolic heart failure, so whether ejection fraction is low or it's actually like normal, their problem is they're having a difficulty getting blood out of the heart, right? So their cardiac output is low. So what I say, they have a low cardiac output. A low cardiac output is another way of saying it's a low effective arterial blood volume, <laughs> right? The effective arterial blood volume is low. What does that do? Stimulates ADH. If ADH is produced, what does it go and do? It increases the water reabsorption. And if you increase the water reabsorption, you're gonna cause the patient to have more water in their body than they will have sodium. And so what that does is that increases the total body water relative to the amount of sodium. And that's why the patient looks hypervolemic. They look like the Michelin man, right? They got edema all over their arms and legs. They got fluid in their lungs oftentimes because their venous pressures are very high and it backflows. So if the left-sided pressures are high, it may backflow into the lungs causing pulmonary edema. If their right-sided pressures are high, it may plump up their jugular vein or cause their legs to become very swollen. Their abdomen become maybe more distended because of ascites. So those are the things that I want you guys to think about here. So again, you can see that with CHF. Now, that's one. The second thing here is really interesting. So when a patient has cirrhosis, there's two particular ways that it may cause hyponatremia. Oftentimes, cirrhosis is a very poor prognostic sign. Um, sorry, if a patient has hyponatremia and they have cirrhosis, it's a very poor prognostic sign and should push them up the transplant list if they're kind of a true candidate for it. But let's say that the patient has cirrhosis, right? So they have a lot of this kind of like fibro connective tissue kind of like a, accumulation. And what it does is it actually causes that lot to form on these actual hepatic portal veins. And what does that do to the hepatic portal vessels? It increases the pressures. So oftentimes these patients will develop who have cirrhosis, what's called portal hypertension, right? That's a result of the high blood pressure that's in these portal veins due to cirrhosis. So the pressure trying to flow through here is very low. That means very little volume will kind of get through the actual liver, right? And so what happens is the liver tries to release these molecules to try to be able to cause the portal vein to dilate, things like nitric oxide. Unfortunately, some of these nitric oxide molecules get into your actual systemic circulation. And if these nitric oxide molecules get into your systemic circulation, guess what the nitric oxide does to your blood vessels? It actually causes them to vasodilate. 
So then you're going to get a lot of nitric oxide causing this systemic vasodilation effect, especially of the splanchnic vessels, which some of those supply the kidney. If you cause this splanchnic vasodilation, so what this may cause is splanchnic vasodilation. When you dilate these vessels, what you do is you lower their effective arterial blood volume, believe it or not, because now the amount of volume within the vessel is actually lower with respect to the size of the vessel. Because you got a big old plump vessel and very little fluid in it now, the effective arterial blood volume is now reduced. If you have a low effective arterial blood volume, you're actually not going to perfuse the kidneys as well. And so what happens is the kidneys start to undesirably activate what? <laughs> they stimulate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And guess what this son of a gun does? He goes and tries to stimulate ADH production and increase your total body water, which causes what? Hyponatremia. That'll drop down your sodium. And again, we know this mechanism. Why? Because again, if you think about this concept here, if ADH is actually going to be present, then ADH will do what? Bind onto these tubular cells in the collecting duct and increase the reabsorption of water. And if you increase the reabsorption relative to the actual amount of sodium, what's going to happen? You're going to cause a dilutional effect on the actual sodium and cause hyponatremia. So that's some of the ways that this can actually happen. Plus the low effect of arterial blood volume will also do what? It may indirectly stimulate ADH via this pathway, but it also can directly stimulate ADH as well. So you're going to see this type of effect here. And again, it's, whole, it's all often due to, to what kind of disease here? Cirrhosis. So you can see this in cirrhosis because in these patients they have portal hypertension, causes vasodilator chemicals to actually cause the portal vessels to try to dilate. But they get into the systemic circulation causing splanchnic vasodilation. That causes a decrease in the effect of arterial blood volume, which indirect, indirectly activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and increases ADH, but it also directly increases ADH production. If you increase ADH production, you increase your total body water, and then you increase your amount of water in the blood vessels relative to sodium, it will drop the patient's sodium. I hope that makes sense. So you can see this in CHF, you can see this in cirrhosis. One more thing, cirrhosis actually uh, can cause another effect here, which is really interesting. That's why if you do see hyponatremia in a patient with cirrhosis, this is a very poor prognostic sign. So if a patient has something called cirrhosis or they have something called nephrotic syndrome, here's another way that we can see a drop in the effect of arterial blood volume. Um, nephrotic syndrome. In these diseases, either your liver loses the ability to produce a protein called albumin or your kidneys pee out a lot of the albumin. So either way, the amount of albumin that they're contributing to the bloodstream drops. All right. So let's say here's going to be some albumin molecules here. So here's some albumin molecules. There's very little of them now. Why? Because in cirrhosis, you can't produce albumin because it's a protein producing factory. And in nephrotic syndrome, you're peeing out all the albumin. And so there's very little albumin within the blood. Albumin generates an osmotic gradient. So it helps to be able to keep water present in the bloodstream. So it helps to keep the water molecules present within the bloodstream. But if you don't have that osmotic gradient, can you pull the water into the bloodstream? No. And so if you can't pull the water into the bloodstream, you don't get a lot of these water molecules to stay in the bloodstream. And so what happens to the amount of water then, theoretically, in the bloodstream? It drops. If you drop the amount of water, technically you drop the blood volume. And if you drop the blood volume, you theoretically drop the effective arterial blood volume. And that will stimulate ADH production. And we already know what if you stimulate ADH production does, it causes the reabsorption of water across the kidneys to be able to bring more water into the bloodstream, cause you to drink more and try to reabsorb more across the GIT. And again, dilutes down your sodium. So that's why these patients will have lots of fluid, not in their vessels sometimes, but where? If the water can't go keep in their vessels, sometimes it leaks into the interstitial spaces and into the cellular components. So that's a very important concept to remember. Now, one more thing here is in these patients, their kidneys should be functioning properly when it comes to reabsorbing sodium.
So again, there's no problem with these patients being able to reabsorb sodium in this, uh, the uh, ascending limit loop of Henle, reabsorb sodium in the early distal convoluted tubule, and reabsorb sodium in the uh, uh, aldosterone-dependent portions. So the amount of sodium that's present within their urine shouldn't be very high. It should be on the lower end of the normal end. So generally, the urine sodium should be what? On the lower end, lower to normal end, right? So we shouldn't have tons and tons and tons of sodium present in the urine in this patient population. And again, we say less than 20. Why? Because their kidneys are intact. They're good at being able to reabsorb sodium and reabsorb water, okay? So that's an important concept to remember here. So again, if I have a patient population who I'm not, I'm not sure what's their ADH dependent cause of hyponatremia, what can I do? Okay, think, is it volume depletion? If it's volume depletion, they're either losing it from the kidneys or they're losing it from another source. So then how do I go about determining that? Urine sodium. If the urine sodium's high, they're losing it from the kidneys. Think about diuretics, low aldosterone causes. If their urine sodium is low, that means that their kidneys aren't the source. They're either losing that volume from their skin, from their pancreas, from their blood system, or from their GIT. And then if the urine sodium is also low and they look puffy and their effective arterial blood volume is maybe on the lower end because of CHF cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome, then go thinking about these as the potential cause. And sometimes looking at volume status can be a very tricky thing, but I will teach you guys some tricks in a second. So you guys are probably at the point where we talked about, okay, I guess that's all the ADH dependent causes. No, there's one more. And it's the one where it has nothing to do with volume, not, no volume depletion, uh, no of low effective arterial blood volume and the patient looks puffy or hypervolemic, this is the patient population where the volume status looks almost completely normal. There is no true issues with volume status, like they don't have a low effective arterial blood volume, they don't have a low volume depletion, they don't have an undesirable activation of the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system uh, that's excessive or anything like that. This is a weird thing where patients are producing ADH inappropriately without a true strong stimulus. What are those things? Let's talk about that. All right, my friends, so the next one's a little bit funky. So this is basically where a patient does not have any volume depletion, right? They don't have any decreased effective arterial blood volume, and there's no true excessive you know, activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. There's a lot of things that can activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, but it's, it's not excessive, okay, to the point where we talked about in situations like, you know, cirrhosis that's causing that splanchnic vasodilation and, you know, decreased perfusion to the kidneys, things like that. We're not seeing excessive amounts. So I think the first thing to think about is, okay, if the patient does not have a volume depletion, if they don't have a decreased effective arterial blood volume, they're not truly volume down from the volume depletion aspect. They're not hypervolemic, meaning that they don't have an increased total body water. Um, like in excessive situations, like they don't look at the Michelin man, all right? That's a severe case scenario. Um, it, so they're not hypervolemic or a low effective arterial blood volume, and there's no you know, undesirable or excessive activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. What's, what's their volume status then? It's normal. So oftentimes these patients are euvolemic. So that's sometimes the terms that you may hear. I'm gonna write that here on the side just because I want you guys to remember it. Another terminology for this, where it's this straight arrow here is, Euvolemic. Their volume status is normal. That means that there is no issue with their volume depletion, and there's no issue with effective arterial blood volume, and there's no issue with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. That's not their problem. That means that the posterior pituitary is producing ADH, or another part of the body is producing ADH, from some for some other reason and it's a really interesting concept so let's talk about that the first one that i want you to remember is actually in situations where the patient maybe has adrenal insufficiency so they produce very little cortisol and this is the primary problem so there is other kind of hormones that your adrenal gland actually makes right but this is the primary one so it's whenever a patient is producing very little cortisol now you're like, okay, well, what the heck? I know cortisol does have some effect on reabsorption of sodium, right? So I know that cortisol does actually play a role in the proximal convoluted tubule. It actually does help to reabsorb sodium at this point. So if you have low cortisol, then what's gonna happen? Then, okay, then I won't absorb this sodium and I'll lose some of the sodium in the urine, right? So some of the sodium may end up in the urine as a result of that. Okay, so that's, that's one effect, absolutely. That's one effect, but that doesn't explain the ADH problem. 
Well, you know what's really interesting? ADH, so here we said that there's neurons, right? There's these neurons in the hypothalamus, they come down to the posterior pituitary, and they pump out this hormone called ADH. You know some of these neurons? <laughs> there's other neurons that may produce a little bit of ADH. So when patients have low cortisol, so let's say that their adrenal cortex is pumping out low levels of cortisol, the natural response is, is to tell the actual hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will then say, okay, if that's the case, I'm gonna take this reaction, I'm gonna bring it out over here to the right so you guys see it. So I'm gonna take this reaction here, and I'm gonna zoom it out over here. There's neurons that will release something called CRH. So it should stimulate this process called the production of CRH. CRH should then go and stimulate other neurons to produce what? ACTH. And then ACTH should then go to the actual adrenal cortex and try to stimulate them to produce more cortisol. That's the natural kind of like negative feedback system, right? That low cortisol tells the hypothalamus to make CRH, CRH tells the pituitary to make ACTH. ACTH then tells the actual adrenal gland to pump up the cortisol. But you know what else happens? It also pumps out ADH. There is the pathology there. So there is your pathology, my friends, so that in this situation, your low cortisol is stimulating an increase in CRH, which is trying to stimulate an increase in ACTH production, but it's also causing ADH production to be undesirably increased. That means ADH will then come down here to your actual kidneys. It'll act on the, what receptor here? Let's actually bring that receptor here, the vasopressin, to receptor, stimulate this receptor, and start reabsorbing tons of water across the kidneys. It'll bring lots of water across the actual collecting duct and into the bloodstream. And then by that default, what happens then? What happens to the amount of water then? Then you're gonna technically just slightly increase your total body water, but your sodium should be rock solid normal. So you're not, you shouldn't be technically losing very much sodium. You may lose a little bit of sodium from cortisol kind of in the kidneys. There may be a little bit of sodium loss, but it's not gonna be excessive. But the amount of water that you reabsorb, your total body water is just a slightly increased. So it's normal to just slightly increase because I'm reabsorbing more water across the collecting duct because ADH is inappropriately produced via this mechanism. I think that's pretty cool and I hope that makes sense. But this leads to the next question. And if I'm losing, so is there another way that I can say, okay, Zach, you said urine sodium was low in situations of um, CHF, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome. You said it was low in extra renal losses that cause volume depletion, such as, you know, <clears throat> vomiting was the exception. Remember that one. But diarrhea, pancreatitis, bleeding, burns, excessive sweating from fevers, things like that. That, that, that made sense. Okay, what about this one? Is urine sodium a little bit affected? Well, think about it. What, hap what happened to the sodium? I, I inhibited its reabsorption here at the proximal convoluted tubule. So the urine sodium will be a little elevated. So that's an important thing to remember here. So yes, the urine sodium, let's actually just write it right here, the urine sodium theoretically and patients who have low cortisol could be what? Slightly elevated, meaning greater than 20. Urine sodium greater than 20. Okay, very cool, very interesting concept then. Okay, that leads to the next concept then. Okay, we talked about low cortisol. There's another situation here. And this one's probably, I'm not gonna lie, probably one of the more common causes of hyponatremia. Let's talk about the very feared SIADH, my friends. All right, SIADH. Now, in true reality, this could deserve its own like lecture, but I, th I think it's really kind of like, it's fear because it's kind of complicated and when it comes to like the diagnostics of it. But oftentimes, whenever you, when in doubt, if you can't figure out the reason why the patient has hyponatremia, it's likely SIADH. It's just, you gotta be really careful because SIADH truly is one of those diagno diagnostics of exclusion, but it happens to be sometimes the most common cause. And there's a lot of different reasons for it. So we know that yes, the hypothalamus has neurons that come down to the posterior pituitary, triggers that puppy to make ADH. And then we know that ADH will then go and work on the kidney tubules, work on the thirst mechanisms, work on our blood vessels, all of those things. But again, there has to be a true stimulus as to why you want to reabsorb more water, uh, why you want to increase your effective arterial blood volume, replete your volume, um, increase your cardiac output and blood pressure, all of those things. But 
In this situation, there is no true appropriate stimulus. It's inappropriate. And sometimes what I've seen is a lot of the times this can be drug related. So sometimes I can see this a lot with uh, particular types of medications or drugs. So you can see this, believe it or not, with things like SSRIs. So, you know, uh, things like of that nature, antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, you can see this uh, to some degree as well with a lot of like um, medications for seizures. So some of the things like carbamazepine is a very, very common one. And we could, we could keep going on. There's, there's lots and lots and lots of drugs. I'm just gonna put here, et cetera. To go through every single drug I think is excessive, but some of the more common ones that may come up on your exam tend to be SSRIs, carbamazepine, other anti-epileptics of sorts. But drugs are definitely one. And they may, by some particular mechanism, stimulate this inappropriate production of ADH that causes ADH levels to just increase undesirably. And this is due to a medication effect. There's another reason. There could be a malignancy. So sometimes, um, you know, you could see this sometimes in certain types of intracranial pathology. So let's actually say that. So let's say that there's some type of intracranial pathology, whatever this may be. You can see this in things like strokes, bleeds, subarachnoid hemorrhages. So think about that as well as a potential etiology. So one could be drugs that could trigger an inappropriate production of ADH. A second one that I really want you to remember is any kind of intracranial pathology. These are really, really important. Um, a lot of the patients that I tend to see who may have large strokes, large hemispheric strokes, large bleeds, subarachnoid hemorrhages, tumors, things to that effect, they may actually trigger this ADH production. And then again, cause an inappropriate production of ADH. Another thing is actually pulmonary pathologies. So pulmonary pathologies is a huge one. Um, so if I see a lot of like uh, patients who may have a very mild kind of like sodium drop, think about things like COPD. Think about pneumonia. I know this sounds crazy, but even positive pressure ventilation. So then being intubated is actually a, a trigger for hyponatremia. So these are some of the things. So I like to think about, is there a pulmonary pathology? Oh, ARDS. ARDS is a really big one as well. Don't forget that one. But there's a lot of different diseases. TB, I'm not even kidding. There's so many pulmonary pathologies. But my thing is, is there a lung problem? Is there a brain problem? Is there a drug problem? And then there's one more etiology that I want you guys to think about here. And this third one here is malignancy. So malignancy. Oftentimes, you'll see this with intracranial, or you'll see this with pulmonary pathologies. You may, at times, see this with colon. So any type of colorectal cancer, any type of malignancy, there could be two potential thoughts behind this. One is that it could be the tumor. Oftentimes, I'm not gonna lie to you, the most common one is lung, where the lung actually has the ability to pump out ADH, or this tumor here has the ability to pump out ADH, or this tumor here has the ability to pump out ADH. But that could be the potential etiology, is that the patient is producing an inappropriate amount of ADH due to an ectopic or malignant source, or there's drugs intracranial or pulmonary pathologies that are causing a stimulus of the pituitary and causing it to produce ADH. And it has nothing at all to do with volume depletion, effective arterial blood volume, or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which is very interesting. But out of all of these things, if ADH is inappropriately produced due to an ectopic source or a stimulus from these particular uh, etiologies, what's the overarching kind of effect here? And I think it did three twice. This is actually four. This would be the fourth trigger. I apologize. So the fourth trigger would be malignancy. But if ADH is produced, we know that, again, kidneys are intact, right? For the most part in this theory, theoretical situation, you could be reabsorbing sodium, reabsorbing sodium, reabsorbing sodium within all of these thoughts here. But here's the big thing. ADH is really working at a high level here. It's really working at a high level and it's really, really trying to reabsorb as much water across the GIT, as, I'm sorry, across the kidneys as it possibly can. And so it is really trying to pull lots of water across the kidneys so that very little water is present in the urine. 
If that's the case, even though you are reabsorbing some of this sodium because the kidney tubules may be intact, you're still going to lose some of the sodium in the urine. You're always going to lose some of the sodium in the urine. So there's always going to be some degree of sodium loss into the urine. But you're reabsorbing so much water that the amount of sodium that could be present in the urine could still be pretty dang high because you reabsorb so much water. And so in this situation, this is one of the few kind of situations here where I want you to again remember that the urine sodium will actually be high. And I know that may seem like slightly confusing here because there's no true loss of sodium somewhere. It's just you're reabsorbing so much water that the amount of sodium in the urine in comparison to the water is just so high. There's so much more sodium in the actual urine than there is water. So the urine sodium will be on the higher end because you're reabsorbing tons of water and also the urine osmolality will be very high. So that's the big thing that I want you guys to remember for this. So this would be, again, what is this situation here called? This disease is called SIADH. Really want you to remember that. So it's an inappropriate, of AD, inappropriate ADH production due to a pulmonary pathology, an intracranial pathology, such as, a, again, a tumor, a stroke, a bleed, um, a mass, some type of drug such as SSRIs, carbamazepine, pulmonary pathologies such as COPD, pneumonia, pneumothorax, positive pressure ventilation, ARDS, or it could be an ectopic source of ADH production from a malignancy, most commonly lung cancer. Okay, but it could be from a uh, intracranial pathology or sometimes colorectal renal carcinomas as well. All right, my friends, we come to the last cause, the last cause here. The, this last one here is in a patient who has hypothyroidism. And I'm not gonna lie to you, there, I, there, there was a lot of like literature um, that could be written about hyponatremia, but not a ton that explained the true pathophysiology. So I'm gonna kind of dumb it down a little bit for you guys. So in this situation, the patient is not producing an adequate amount of T3 and T4. So this is called hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is an interesting kind of situation here. So T3 and T4 control your heart rate, your cardiac output, and even to some degree, it even controls the glomerular filtration rate. And so what the literature has shown from this is that whenever the T3 and T4 are on the low end, it affects the heart and it affects the kidneys. And what it may do is, is it may drop your cardiac output. Because it actually, you know uh, thyroid hormone controls the sensitivity of the beta receptors, the beta one and the beta two receptors? So it'll drop, effectively it'll drop your heart rate, so you won't have as many conductions that are moving through the heart, right? So it'll drop the heart rate, and it'll also drop the contractility, it controls the beta one receptors and the contractile portion of the heart. If you drop the heart rate, and you drop the stroke volume, uh, stroke volume what are you gonna do to your cardiac output? You drop your cardiac output. What is cardiac output? Again, this is one of those weird situations. What does it do? to the actual uh, posterior pituitary hypothalamic area, it triggers the production of ADH. It triggers the production of ADH. And so that's a weird concept because Zach, you were saying that this was actually one of those situations where it's an inappropriate production of ADH. It doesn't have to do with volume depletion. It doesn't have to do with uh, a low effect of arterial blood volume. Well, truly this patient is not actually volume depleted. And their effect of arterial blood volume, yeah, it may be on the lower end, but again, it's due to an endocrinopathy. And again, this is why it's kind of a slightly weirder situation here. The other thing is it may actually reduce the glomerular filtration rate. And again, a weird concept here. But if you lower your glomerular filtration rate, what do you do to your renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system? You activate your renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which does what? Stimulates ADH production. And if ADH production increases, what does that do? It then goes, acts on the kidneys. And if it acts on the kidneys, what is it gonna to do to the kidneys? It's actually going to stimulate them to reabsorb water. And if you reabsorb your water, you're gonna increase your total body water just a little bit. Even though your serum sodium should be, your actual total body sodium should be normal, your total body water will just go up a little bit and it'll drop your sodium. Now the next question is, what about the urine sodium? Will the urine sodium be high? Will it be low? Well, oftentimes in this situation here, because of, again, reabsorbing a little bit more water than you are and with respect to the sodium, again, you're gonna lose some sodium into the actual urine. It's gonna be similar to the SIADH. So it's a similar effect. You're reabsorbing a lot of water, but you're gonna have, again, very little water that's present in the urine 
So with respect to this, your water is actually going to be very low. But your sodium, because you reabsorb a lot of this water, very little uh, sodium is actually going to be getting reabsorbed in comparison to that. The actual urine, sodium in this situation should be high. Again, this is one of the only few um, euvolemic hyponatremias that truly has a lot of pathology to explain it. So I hate to say this, but unfortunately, just try your best to remember that hypothyroidism can cause a drop in the cardiac output because it decreases the sensitivity of the beta receptors in the heart. And it also reduces your GFR because of maybe even a decrease in cardiac output. And because of this, this leads to what? The overarching effect here is that you'll activate ADH production, which will cause reabsorption of water, increasing the total body water with respect to the normal total sodium, and that'll cause your hypo, uh, hyponatremia to occur. But the volume status in these patients should be relatively normal. The one thing else here is that because you're causing a lot more water reabsorption and very little sodium reabsorption in comparison to that, the sodium will be a little bit more elevated, again, greater than 20. So this is the things that we think about with uh, you know, the euvolemic hyponatremias is SIADH, low cortisol, and hypothyroidism. So, so far up to this point, we have said, patient has hyponatremia, check the serum osms. Is it real? So in other words, is it hypotonic hyponatremia? Or is it pseudo? Is it a hypertonic, isotonic? Determine the proteins, the lipids, determine the glucose, the mannitol, the uh, status post TERP medications. Okay, we determined that it's hypotonic. Is ADH on or off? How do I determine that? Urine osmolality. If urine osmolality is high, I'm reabsorbing a lot of water. Very little water present in my, my actual urine. So ADH is on. If the actual urine osmolality is very low, that means ADH is off. That means I'm losing a lot of water into my kidneys. If that's the situation, I could say is it ADH dependent or ADH independent? We've gone through all the ADH dependent causes. And the way that I can look at that is I can say, okay, are they volume down? So then I look at, are, are they volume depleted? Have they lost things from their kidneys? Is it diuretics, low aldosterone causes? Or is it extra renal losses? Are they vomiting, diarrhea? Is there any situation where they have pancreatitis, bleeding, burns, excessive amounts of sweating from fevers? Okay, I can go through this and think about that. And then how do I determine if it's a true extra renal versus renal? Look at the kidneys. Look at the urine sodium. If I'm dumping a lot of sodium in my urine, then it's because the kidneys are responsible for that. That's your diuretic, your low aldosterone cause. If it's, if it's normal or if it's high, uh, sorry, if it's, if it's a lower end, I apologize, lower end, that means that the kidneys are not the problem for the loss of sodium. It's the skin, it's the pancreas, it's the bleeding, or it's the GIT causes. Then you go, okay, is the patient hypervolemic? Do they look puffy? Do they have a lot of fluid in their lungs? Do they look edematous? Do they look like the Michelin man? They're hypervolemic, but their effective arterial blood volume, the amount of volume circulating through the bloodstream is in the lower end. Their cardiac output's low. This could be CHF, cirrhosis, or nephrotic syndrome. And again, in all these situations, their kidney tubules are intact, reabsorbing sodium. And then again, they're actually going to be reabsorbing water. Their urine sodium should again be on the lower end. The last situation here is where a patient is, again, inappropriately producing ADH. The two ones that make the most sense are going to be hypocortisolism. They're producing very little cortisol. It's triggering the production of ACTH and then inadvertently ADH levels. And then again, you're losing a lot of sodium into the urine because cortisol actually causes sodium reabsorption. And again, you're also causing lots of water reabsorption from the kidney, so there's going to be more water that's actually going to be taken out of the urine. And again, more sodium is going to get lost. SADH, there's a pulmonary, intracranial, or drug pathology causing this inappropriate ADH production, or there's a malignancy that's pumping it out. ADH is being produced in large amounts, which is causing massive reabsorptions of water, and again, very little sodium to actually be reabsorbed in comparison to the water, so the urine sodium is going to be on the higher end. And then the last one, which is the little funky one, is the hypothyroidism, which drops your cardiac output, drops your GFR, causes ADH production, reabsorbs lots of water, but again, your urine sodium will be high. These are the weird ones, and I know the urine sodium part may be a little bit more complicated, but just do your best to remember that euvolemic hyponatremias are usually going to have high urine sodiums. That's low cortisol, SADH, and hypothyroidism. All right, my friends, now the question that you probably need to ask then is, okay, I used my urine sodium, I use my history to determine which ADH dependent type. Well, the next thing is I don't really know how to determine the volume status of the patient. How do I determine if their volume down? How do I determine if their volume up? How do I determine if their volume is normal? Because obviously that's one of the features that you were looking at here, Zach, is you were trying to tell me if the volume is depleted, if they look volume depleted, 
think about these. If they're volume up, if they look hypervolemic, think about these. And if they're euvolemic, think about these. Well, how do I really determine that, Zach? I got you. Let me teach you a little bit about volume status. All right, my friends, so we talked about all of the ADH-dependent hyponatremias. Again, the, the big thing that, I'll, I'll go through the diagnostics again. I'll give you guys a little kind of recap of everything in a quicker, succinct kind of way. But it's important to remember that when we talk about volume depleted, the easiest way to differentiate those is obviously urine sodium, right? When we talk about the hypervolemic, obviously one of the easiest ways to determine that is their exam. When it comes to the euvolemic patient, we really look at that urine osmolality and we try to use our volume exam. Again, urine sodium could sometimes be beneficial. And again, I think one of the important things is that it may have seemed confusing, especially with the uh, SIADH and hypothyroidism, that urine sodium was a little bit elevated, that it seems like maybe a little bit confusing. A lot of textbooks actually have contradictions against that. Some say that the urine sodium could be appropriately normal, and some say that they could be increased. But again, I think one of the big things that you may see as a question on your exam may be something to help you point to that. And I find that sometimes the difficult thing is to determine if the patient is euvolemic or hypervolemic. Oftentimes, volume depletion sometimes is a little bit easy, but Volume status is a very challenging thing. There was, um, I think, a study once where they took like a bunch of nephrologists and tried to determine a patient population if they were uh, volume depleted, hypervolemic, or euvolemic. I think like 47 or 49 percent of the actual nephrologists were able to identify correctly the patient's volume status. And so it just goes to show that it's a very difficult thing to determine a patient's volume status. So use a lot of different things. History, physical exam are very crucial. Other kind of tools and kits I'll show you guys to use as well. One of the things I like to use is vitals. It's not always helpful, but oftentimes if I look and the patient's heart rate is like through the roof, so if I see that they're extremely tachycardic and their BP maybe is a little bit on the softer end, that maybe is a little bit helpful, especially for patients who are hypovolemic. So if I see a patient who has a very high heart rate and a low blood pressure, especially their systolic blood pressure, right there their shock index may be on the higher end. Now, that right there could tell me, okay, could it be potentially, in this patient population, could it maybe be something like a hypovolemia cause? Absolutely it could. And the other thing is, could it be a hypervolemic cause? Absolutely it could. And so you gotta think about these things, and we'll talk about other tools, but oftentimes I like to think about, is this a volume depletion cause? Are they super, super volume depleted to the point where they're almost in hypovolemic shock? So sometimes you can see that to the point where they're in what's called a shock state. Because oftentimes we can utilize what's called heart rate and systolic blood pressure to determine the patient's shock index. Another thing is, could it actually be due to a very low effective arterial blood volume? And if the effective arterial blood volume is low, this could actually produce a shock state as well. Absolutely it could. In situations where patients maybe are losing blood or they're losing massive amounts of volume, this could be something like a hypovolemic shock. This may be hypovolemic shock. So sometimes you may see this. And the other thing is if their blood pressure and heart rate are gonna be like this, this could also be maybe a cardiogenic shock. So what if the patient's cardiac output is so poor that they're not able to generate a proper blood pressure and so they develop a tachycardia as a compensatory mechanism. This is definitely the case. So you see how sometimes vitals may sometimes be helpful. If it's really on the lower end, think about hypovolemia. Look at their history. Have they been taking a lot of like, have they had a lot of vomiting, a lot of diarrhea, poor PO intake? That's an important thing to think about. Or does the patient have a heart failure? Did they just have an MI? What put them into cardiogenic shock? The next thing I like to look at is I like to, I haven't found these to be very helpful, but they do mention it on your exams. So mucous membranes. So checking those mucous membranes may sometimes be somewhat beneficial. Looking at the eyes, do they look sunk in? So do the eyes sink in? Look at the tongue and the oral, the buccal membranes. So do they look dry or do they look moist? I think those are important things to kind of figure out because if a patient has dry mucous membranes, that means that they may be on the hypovolemia end. If they're moist, if their eyes kind of don't look very sunken in, they may actually be more on the normal volume kind of end, right? So that's an important thing to think about. The other thing I actually can, uh, would consider potentially again for the exams is skin turgor. 
So you kind of pinch the patient's skin and see how long or how, if it returns back quickly to its normal kind of elasticity. So patients who are super, super dehydrated, it'll let go and it'll take a long time for them to be able to get that turgor to go back. And so I like to think about that as well. So sometimes this can be very helpful. So patients who have a very kind of delayed skin turgor, um, that may be very helpful. So if they have a very delayed kind of skin turgor where it takes a long time for that skin to kind of go back into place, this may be somewhat indicative of like a hypovolemia type of cause. So that's something else to potentially think about. Okay. Now, that would cover, I think, some of the first beginning steps. So one of the first things I do when I go into the room is I look at the patient's vitals on the monitor. I like to look at their heart rate. Are they super tachycardic? And is there blood pressure on the softer end? That tachycardia may be a compensatory response, especially if it's a sinus tachycardia. Are they losing volume? Or are they not pumping enough volume out of their heart? That's the first thing I like to think about. And that can kind of help me to risk stratify. Then I try to take a look at their mucous membranes, see if their eyes look sunken in, do their oral mucous membranes and nose look super dry, do they look moist and clear, good color. Skin turgor, is it taking a long time for the skin to go back to the normal kind of position? That could be indicative of hypovolemia. Just again, remember, you have a lot of elderly people who might not have as good elasticity in their skin. So again, I haven't found them to be super useful, but it's something to think about. What are some other things that I like to utilize? Let's go down here. Okay, so the next thing here that I actually find very useful is to go and listen to their you know, lungs. So take a listen. So when I auscultate, do I hear any kind of like uh, crackles, uh, rails? Uh, that's a really helpful sign because that could be potentially indicative um, of, of pulmonary edema. So what I like to also do is uh, sometimes getting a chest x-ray or doing a bedside ultrasound are very, very helpful. So utilize these in addition. So use things like a chest x-ray, use a bedside ultrasound. And again, these things may lead you to a very overarching theme that if I see a lot of pulmonary edema, if I see a lot of pulmonary edema, this tells me that this is a lot of increased in total body water relative to the sodium. And so this could tell me there's a lot of like, you know, a, a hypervolemic type of state. So that's a really, really important thing to think about is to think about that hypervolemia as a potential cause. In other words, this is the patient with a low effect of arterial blood volume. They may be having something such as CHF where their left sided pressures are backing up or high and backing up into the lungs. Remember I talked to you about that? So very, very important thing to think about. Whereas if they're dry, I don't hear any crackles, no rails, their chest x-ray ultrasound shows no pulmonary edema, this could be a euvolemic patient or a hypovolemic patient. So you see how sometimes volume status can be really tricky, but that's one thing I like to look at. I also like to look, are the right-sided pressures really high or do they have a cirrhotic you know, pro type of problem? So do they have any type of generalized edema? Because if they have a big old fat legs, this could be indicative of high right-sided pressures. And high right-sided pressures could be potentially indicative of what? Could be indicative of a hypervolemic cause. And again, just as an example here, i.e. CHF. I also like to think, okay, maybe it's not just generalized edema from CHF. Maybe they also have something going on with their liver too. So what if they have, again, that problem where they have cirrhosis or, and that's causing that splenic vasodilation problem, or what if they have nephrotic syndrome and they're not producing an adic, they're peeing out a ton of albumin into their actual urine. And so because of that, they have very little albumin in their blood, and so because they have very little albumin in their blood, they can't keep fluid, what? In the actual blood vessels, so it causes it to leak into different spaces, such as the legs or into the abdomen, causing a lot of ascites. And so the other thing I like to look at is, is there any ascites or hepatomegaly? This could be helpful because again, you can see this in both a hypervolemia cause. So I could see this in what else? If I saw both of these, I could see this in situations such as cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome. So again, it leads me to kind of like a hypervolemia type of cause. And you can see this in a lot of them. You can see this again in which ones? I could see all of these really in CHF, cirrhosis, and nephrotic syndrome. 
So this is one of the parts of the exams that I find sometimes to be beneficial. So look at their vitals, look at their skin, look at their mucous membranes, evaluate their lungs. Do they have a lot of pulmonary edema? Do they have crackles and rails that are evident there? Could be a hypervolemic cause. Do they also have generalized edema and ascites? Could be high right-sided pressures or cirrhosis nephrotic syndrome problems where there's very little albumin and low effect of arterial blood volume. And in these situations, what's happening? It's causing a hypervolemic type of presentation with generalized edema, ascites, or hepatomegaly. So these are things to be considerate of. The last thing that I also like to utilize here is I like to look at the jugular vein. So not only could right side pressures cause these, but what if the jugular vein is super distended, look for any evidence of jugular venous distension. Because if the jugular venous distension is actually really high, this could be indicative of what? A hypervolemic cause potentially. Meaning that the right sided pressures could be very elevated. So it could possibly be indicative of what? A hypervolemia, possibly. I also like to use my ultrasound and check the IVC diameter. So what's the IVC diameter? Now this isn't always perfect, but if the IVC is very, very collapsed, very, very collapsed, it's very, 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 very small, versus if it's plethoric and big as a son of a gun, then what could it mean? Well, big country, it could mean a lot of different things. So sometimes this hasn't been perfect, but it may be, if it's super collapsed, it could be indicative of a hypovolemia type of state. Whereas if it's super plethoric and big, it could be indicative of high right-sided pressures or a very hypervolemic type of state. So these are things to potentially consider. And so that's something else I like to do. Another thing I like to do is while I'm here, if I'm doing the ultrasound, check their heart. You know, ultrasound their left ventricular side and see if they have any decreased left ventricular ejection fraction, if they have any diastolic dysfunction. So this could be another thing to utilize there because it, again, it'll point right towards your source of the patient's hyponatremia. So these are some of the things that I like to utilize. Again, I like to look at the, the vitals. I like to look at, again, not only that, but the skin turgor, the mucous membranes to a smaller degree. I like to listen to the lungs, use my ultrasound, look at the chest x-ray, evaluate their extremities, look at the belly, see if they have any hepatomegaly or ascites. And again, also use my ultrasound to look to see if there's any IVC collapsibility or the jugular vein, if that looks nice, distended and plethoric as well. And again, also use your ultrasound and take a look at your um, your heart to look to see what's the ejection fraction. Is there any diastolic dysfunction? These are helpful things as well while you're there. But there's a lot of different tools to utilize. Other things is, I'm not kidding, a really good history. Ask the patient, have they been vomiting? Have they had any diarrhea? Have they not been eating very much? Have they had any blood loss that they're aware of that they didn't tell you or something? Sometimes they will not tell you. Have they been taking a little bit too much of their diuretic? You know, uh, I think it's really important to get a good history from these patients in combination with their volume status, the objective of exam, exam to help you in determining the actual true etiology. But sometimes volume status may be somewhat beneficial if it's in a perfect world. Okay, my friends, let's now talk about the last part here, which is we've gone through hyponatremia, serum osms is on the what? Truly, to be true, low end. Check the urine osms. Urine osms will tell me if the patient's ADH is on or off. The urine osms is high, very little water in the urine, ADH is on. We went through all the causes. We went through volume depletion, hypervolemic with low effect of arterial blood volume, and a normal volume status. We went over what the volume status would actually look like if we could try to evaluate that on an exam. On top of that, we said if the actual urine osms are on the, what, lower end, that means that ADH is off and lots of water is being lost into the urine and that's causing their urine to be dilute. In that situation, it was primary polydipsia, it was tea and toast, it was also things that we talked about such as end-stage renal disease or beer potomania. That's the ADH independent hyponatremias. Let's briefly talk about those. All right, my friends, let's now talk about the ADH independent hyponatremias. With this particular cause of hyponatremia, it's really interesting. So we talked about how whenever ADH is on, we reabsorb lots and lots of water across the collecting duct into the bloodstream Water increases relative to the amount of sodium 
the tonicity then drops, and then it causes, again, a dilutional type of effect of hyponatremia. We talked about all the causes, volume depletion, low effective arterial blood volume, an inappropriate production of ADH like in low cortisol or low thyroid hormone or SIADH, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But what if it's not due to ADH? <laughs> That's kind of weird then, right? So there's, that means that we have to in some way, shape or form, if it's not ADH that's reabsorbing you know, lots and lots of water across our kidneys or making us drink more so that we actually pull a lot across our GIT, what could be the cause? I want you to think of three causes. The three causes that I want you to think about is water intake problem, solute intake problem, or an inability to excrete free water. And so we're gonna use the arrows here. In this patient population, the first one that I want you to think about is that the water intake is exceedingly high, or the solute intake is extremely, extremely low. Now, in order for the water intake to be high, um, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta consume at least, I'm not even kidding, greater than or equal to 12 liters per day to actually ac accomplish this. And so we see this in the disease called primary polydipsia. And sometimes you can see this in patients that very commonly um, schizophrenics. So you can see this in schizophrenic patients who just have this ex uncontrollable desire to drink very large volumes of water throughout the day. When this happens, if you think about this theoretically, right, how would this work? If a patient is consuming very large volumes of water, that means that they are taking in a lot of water across their GIT into the bloodstream. That means a lot of water is going into the bloodstream. That means we have a ton of water into the bloodstream. Now, ADH wants to reabsorb water. Would you want ADH to be on or off in this situation? You wouldn't want it to be on because they're gonna reabsorb more water. So what happens in this situation is this will shut the ADH off. Because I, I don't want ADH to be produced. Because if ADH is produced, theoretically, if ADH is produced, what's gonna happen? It's gonna bind onto the actual collecting duct, reabsorb more water, and increase the amount of water and worsen the patient's hyponatremia. Ugh, I don't wanna do that. So what happens is ADH gets turned off. If ADH is turned off, then what happens is ADH will not be as present as usual to bind onto the V2 receptors. And if ADH isn't as present, then it will not be able to reabsorb as much water into the bloodstream. Very, very little. So that means tons and tons and tons of water are going to be peepeed out. And you're gonna to try to make a super, super dilute urine. This is gonna have massive amounts of water present within the urine. Because you're drinking so much water, you have to dilute your urine as much as you possibly can. So ADH has to be off. So if ADH is off, then this will do what to the actual urine osmolality? What would this do to urine osmolality? You're gonna have tons of water. So the urine osmolality should be very, very low. And that was one of the things that we talked about, the ADH independent causes. Now, that right there would help you to determine that. If you have a patient who is schizophrenic who is drinking massive amounts of water greater than 12 liters per day, right there you have your diagnosis. You don't need to do any other kind of additional tests or anything like that. Oftentimes, it is truly history that will lead you to the answer here. Okay? So I hope that part makes sense. The next thing is, what if the patient's solute intake is so low? So you see this a lot in the geriatric elderly population, patients who don't have a lot of money and aren't really drinking, a lot, eating a lot of like true substance in their food. In other words, they're not like, getting a lot of proteins, they're not getting a lot of fat, they're not getting a lot of electrolytes in their diet. They're just eating things like primarily carbohydrates, really, and, and fluids, teas, waters, things like that, beer. And so there's two etiologies that I want you guys to remember here. One is called the tea and toast diet. So that's that um, tea, toast, diet, or syndrome. Now this doesn't mean that you have to only eat tea and toast. <laughs> it's just trying to give you an idea that primarily the patient's drinking fluids, right? And their primary diet is a carbohydrate source. You can see this with toast, you can see this with crackers, things like that. And what happens is the basic, I don't want to get too crazy down into the nephrology kind of lane and utilizing a lot of osmolality and stuff like that. But here's what I want you to remember. Solute intake, the amount of solute that you intake determines your urine output. That's, that's, I'm not even kidding. I want you to think about it the simplest way as possible. So here's the way I want you to think about it. If you have a very low solute intake, 
This controls your osmolality gradients, which helps to determine urine production. What would happen to your urine output? Your urine output will decrease. So if your solute intake is low, your urine output will decrease. So you won't make as much urine as general. Okay, now, here's what happens. Another concept here is whenever a patient is, again, not getting a lot of solute into their diet, what it does is, is if you're getting very little solute in your diet, it means that your plasma osmolality is what? So, you know, osmolality within a diet, again, is very important. So if you're not getting a lot of like solute in your diet, then you're not having a lot of things that can affect your tonicity of the blood. And so that what happens is the plasma osmolality in these patients tend to be on the lower end. So if they have a low solute, very little, I'm gonna put black dots here, very little solute, this decreases the plasma osmolality. And what that does is, that, that means that this is not a very strong stimulus for ADH. This inhibits ADH production. If the plasma osmolality, again, is on the lower end, what that tells me is that there can be very little solute in the blood and maybe enough water in the blood. And so I don't want to produce a lot of ADH. So I want ADH to be off in this situation here. I don't want ADH to be on, okay? Now, here's another thing. <clears throat> when urine output is really, really low, Again, this is another important concept. Low solute intake, not only does it cause low urine output, it turns off ADH. And the reason why is because the urine output's low. If ADH was on, what would it do? Reabsorb water and lower the urine output even more. Oh, well, I wanna turn ADH off so I can actually at least produce some type of urine. So if ADH is off, that means that it's not gonna to bind to these V2 receptors as much. If ADH isn't binding to these V2 receptors as much, it's not going to do what? What is it going to do? Is it going to reabsorb tons of water? No. And so what happens then? It doesn't reabsorb water just like it doesn't in this situation. So what happens to the water in the urine? They have lots of water in their urine. Tons and tons and tons of water in their urine. But even though they don't produce a lot of urine output because of the low solute intake, the primary urine that they're producing is very dilute urine. So the urine osmolality in this situation will be very low. But here's the key thing. <clears throat> if the solute intake is low, the urine output's low. Let's, let's just give an example. Let's just give an example. As an example, and as you can see this in not only the tea and toast diet, but you can also see this in another disease called beer potomania. Beer potomania. This is when patients are just primarily the diet's just beer. All they do is they just chugging beers every day. Budweiser, all day. If that's the case where their primary diet is very pretty much beer or again toast crackers things of that nature what happens is that's very little proteins electrolytes true nutrients in the diet you're pretty much just getting carbohydrates and carbohydrates primarily just gets converted into co2 <laughs> i mean that's really what it is and, and, and water but what happens is in this situation here your solute intake is very very low all right so you're a lot of very little nutrients that affects the plasma osmolality that turns ADH off. ADH off means that you actually will not reabsorb a lot of the water and you'll lose that water into your urine because your urine output's gonna be on the lower end and we don't wanna to try to do anything to the plasma osmolality, okay? So if that's the case then, if let's say the solute intake is so low that the urine output, let's just give an example, i.e. urine output in this patient due to, they have a low solute intake. So what, let's say whatever their solute is that they get with beer potomania or tea and toast diet, the urine output is only, we're just gonna say throughout the day, throughout the day, let's say one liter per day. That's all they produce throughout the day, one liter. Is it out of this world to the things that if a patient is pounding beers all day or drinking tea and water, whatever they are in their diet, that it's theoretically not out of this world for them to drink two liters per day? No. So then the problem comes when they decide to drink beer or have lots of tea in their diet and absorb lots of water into their diet. And then if their water intake, so now let's say that they increase their amount of water and their water intake is two liters per day. The amount of water that I'm peeing out is what? less than the amount of water that I'm taking in. That's enough to dilute the actual sodium and drop the sodium. So that's the theoretical effect with the actual low solute intake. So low solute intake causes such as a tea and toast diet, 
or beer potomania, you take in less solute. Less solute intake does two things. One, it lowers your plasma osmolality because you don't have as much solute to be able to bring the plasma osmolality up. If plasma osmolality is down, it turns off ADH. Also, low solute intake means that you have a lower urine output. Uh, just to make, keep it simple, low urine output. If that's the case then, the amount of urine that I do want to make, I want it to have primarily be dilute urine. So ADH is turned off. So the primary urine that I'm producing is dilute. So the urine osmolality is very low. The thought behind this is that if the solute intake is low, your urine output's low. Theoretically, if the solute intake is very, very low, the max amount of urine that the patient can try to make that's dilute is one liter per day. If the patient drinks more fluid via beer, tea, water, whatever it is, then they actually output per day. Theoretically, their water intake outstrips their solute intake and the amount that they're able to produce, what will happen? They will cause a hyponatremia. I hope that makes sense. So again, primarily history here, my friends. Use the urine osmolality to lead you to these causes and then use your history to determine which one of these it is. Let's come to the last one really quickly and blow through that one. All right, my friends, so the last situation here is we have a patient who is taking in way too much water, more water than they actually, their kidneys can produce, right? Um, 12 plus liters, that's a lot, all right? The other one is that the solute intake is really low. The last one here is that what if the kidney loses the ability to excrete free water? So in other words, if I can't excrete free water from my kidneys, that's interesting. That means I retain a lot of water, theoretically, right? So in other words, the patient has damaged kidneys, super, super damaged kidneys. So I'm talking like in stage renal disease. I'm talking like a GFR of like two, so less than 15. If that is the case, here's what happens. Kidneys don't have the ability to excrete free water. So the amount of water that they actually can be able to excrete is very, very limited. So this is one of those weird situations. They have a very decreased ability to excrete free water. If that's the case then, a lot of this water that's actually moving through the kidney, so you have a lot of plasma coming through the kidneys, it's supposed to excrete the free water, and then what happens is, you know, whatever is remaining will get returned back into the bloodstream. Well, I'm having a decreased ability to excrete this free water, so the amount of water within the bloodstream goes up. If the amount of water that's present within the bloodstream goes up, that means what happens? That means that the patient's volume is pretty adequate and that means that their plasma osmolality is really low. What would that do? That would shut the ADH off. I wouldn't want the actual posterior pituitary to produce ADH. So if ADH is off, well, there you go. Now I'm actually going to do what? Try my best, what, to get rid of free water but the kidneys aren't able to do that very well. So that's the problem here, is that the ADH is low, right? So ADH tries to come and bind here, but these kidney tubules are damaged, right? So you'll have low ADH. If there's low ADH, right? You normally, again, ADH would try to bind onto kidney tubules and try to reabsorb water. Again, ADH is not present, it's turned off. So again, what am I going to do here? If ADH is off, am I actually going to reabsorb water in this situation? No. But again, the problem is, is that I, the kidneys have such a difficult ability at being able to excrete free water. And so that's generally the problem here. But generally, again, you're going to try to shut off the water reabsorption because you don't want to reabsorb any more water. So they do their best. They do their absolute best to lose some of this water into the urine, that free water. It's just not enough. And so what happens is, and these patients, they have a lot more fluid kind of within their actual bloodstream, right? So they're more on that hypervolemic end. So this is technically what you could consider a hypervolemic hyponatremia, but it's ADH independent. In this patient population, if they ha aren't making a lot of urine because their kidneys are so damaged. So if their kidneys are super damaged, they have a really, really challenging time of being able to make urine. So even though their urine will try to have a little bit of water in it, it's gonna be very little urine. So their urine output is extremely, extremely, extremely low. 
So it's not enough dilute urine that it's able to excrete. So ADH is off. So yes, they will not reabsorb as much water. And so it'll try its best to actually excrete free water into the urine. But the urine output is so low that it won't even be able to make much urine that's like actually diluted in general. So because of that, the urine output's really, really low. Let's say, let's say that the urine output for them per day is 400 mLs per day. That's all they're able to produce. And they decide to consume via their daily intake of water. They try to have a water intake. Their intake is one liter per day. Well, now their intake is greater than their output. And what happens? They again get this hyponatremia that develops because the amount of water that develops within their bloodstream is higher than the amount of sodium that's present within their bloodstream. And so that's a really important concept here. So again, usually with this patient population, it's not very common. We see this when the patient is in stage renal disease and pretty much at the point of being on hemodialysis. Oftentimes when I see these patients, they come into the hospital because they're getting ready to have hemodialysis and then you check their sodium like the day before they have hemodialysis and it's a little low. And the reason why is, is because again, the urine output's so low, they haven't been dialyzed yet, so they're a little bit hypervolemic because maybe their intake has just been a little bit higher than their ability to put out. And so then once you dialyze them, their sodium kind of comes back up. So that's a really important cause. So again, with the situations where ADH is off, is again, very high water intake, primary polydipsia, very low solute intake, tea and toast diet or beer potomania, or an inability to excrete free water, decrease free water excretion because the kidneys are damaged. ADH is off and it's trying its best to cause the kidneys to dump water and it will dump some water, but these patients are almost to the point of anuric. They barely produce any urine. The water that they, the actual urine that they do produce, the kidneys will do the best job they can to put free water in that urine, but it's such a low urine output. And if their intake outstrips their output, boom, you end up with more water in the blood and therefore diluting down the sodium causing hyponatremia. All right, my friends, we've gone through, at this point, every cause, every pathophysiological process, and believe it or not, the diagnostics of hyponatremia. So what I wanna do is, in a very succinct kind of way, since we've gone through this now, is test your knowledge and say, okay, we have a patient coming in with hyponatremia. What's the test that I order? And then what are the causes that are associated with that? And we're gonna blast through this. And then what we'll do is, we'll talk about a patient who comes in with hyponatremia. How do we treat the one that's acute, severe, symptomatic, and then how do we treat the underlying cause? Let's get into that. All right, my friends, so now what we gotta do is we gotta talk about a diagnostic approach to hyponatremia. So a patient comes in, again, this is really a recap of everything we talked about. It should really be super easy now. Patient comes in, they have a serum sodium of less than 135. So again, let's put that kind of like under here. So their serum sodium is less than 135. If that's the case, we wanna figure out, is this true hyponatremia? In order to check to see if it's true hyponatremia, what's the next test that we'll order? Come on guys, think about it, what is it? Serum osmolality. So that's the next thing that we're gonna do. So I wanna check my serum osmolality. Now remember, the norm was between 280 to 295. So if I go through and I see, I see that my serum osmolality in this particular scenario is one of three particular serum osms. In other words, in this arm here, it's less than, let's say, two I'm sorry, let's actually say it's 280 to 295 over here. So let's say that the serum osms is normal serum osms. So it's a normal serum osms, which we said which was what? That's between 280 to 295. If that's the case, then which one is this? Which one is this, my friends? This is the isotonic hyponatremia. This is isotonic hyponatremia. Isotonic hyponatremia. To quickly go back, what is the particular causes of isotonic hyponatremia? I'm not gonna write them all down. What is it? It is situations where there is lots of lipids, such as hyperlipidemia, or lots of proteins, multiple myeloma, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, or IVIG. In the other situation, the serum osmolality is super, super high. You have a high serum osmolality. If you have a high serum osmolality in this particular scenario, my next question to you, my friends, is, again, in that particular situation, what is the number? That means that this is greater than 295. 
Again, I'm not going to write down all of the causes, but again, I want you to think about it in this situation. What is this called when the serum osmolality is too high? This is called hypertonic hyponatremia. And I want you to think about things like glucose, things like mannitol, things like urea, things like sorbitol or glycine that they use after terps. All right, good. The last one here is you check the serum osmolality and it's low. So in other words, it's less than 280 milliosmoles. This is hypotonic hyponatremia. This is hypotonic hyponatremia. And there is like a plethora of causes. This is the true hyponatremia. If the serum osmolality is actually low, meaning that it is again less than 280, and we figured out that it's a true hyponatremia, what do we do next to determine the cause of it? Well, then I gotta know, is the ADH on or is the ADH off? How do I determine that? Come on, the urine osmolality. So then I check my urine osmolality. If I check my urine osmolality, and in this situation, I get a two-arm approach here now. One of these, the urine osmolality is really what? Low, very low urine osmolality. And the other one, the urine osmolality is super high. If that is the case, if the urine osmolality is very low, I want you to think about this with respect to water. So I want you to think about it, guys. And we use this terminology here for urine osmolality. We used greater than 300 or less than 100. So if the urine osmolality is low, meaning that it is less than 100, that means in that situation that there is a ton of what? Water, ton of water in the urine. So what does that mean for the ADH? That means in this particular situation, the ADH is off, it's suppressed. And if ADH is off or suppressed, that leads to three potential etiologies, my friend, off of this. Off of this, this leads what? One is there is a very high water intake. This is psychogenic or primary polydipsia. It's a very low solute intake, such as tea and toast diet or beer potomania, or there's a very decreased water excretion, such as in in-stage renal disease, like less than 15 GFR on hemodialysis. Okay, then was there anything else that we could do with these? These were those ADH independent hyponatremias. It's all history, baby, all history. In this situation though, hmm, urine osmolality is high. The urine osmolality is high, greater than what, 300. That means there's a lot of solute and very little water. There's very little water, and that means ADH was on. That ADH be on, he's trying to reabsorb all that water. If ADH is on, we said the first thing that we would wanna do is check volume status. So we said that this is really kind of first dependent upon volume status. So you wanna check and see what's their volume status. And we used all those different like ways of being able to describe the patient's volume status. Is it hypervolemic, hypovolemic, is it uvolemic? There's lots of different ways there. So that's where it's gonna kind of lead us into this kind of discussion to this point here, which is what is the volume status, my friends? So is the volume really low? Is the volume high? Or is the patient euvolemic? We use a lot of those terms, right? So in a patient who is volume down, we went through all of those different causes. How do we kind of differentiate which one it is? Remember I told you that there was a renal and extra renal loss? So what do I do? So the next thing I want to do is I want to check my urine sodium. And the reason why I want to check the urine sodium is the urine sodium is gonna tell me, am I losing sodium and water from the kidneys or am I losing it from extra renal sources? So check that urine sodium. If the urine sodium, when we check this puppy here, if the urine sodium comes back high or low, this automatically lends us to some degree of a diagnosis and we can use our history to be able to discern that. So if the urine sodium comes back and the patient is dumping tons of sodium into their urine, what would that tell you? Oh, that would tell me that that's the renal source of their loss. So that means that they have a high urine sodium in comparison to this being a low urine sodium. So we're gonna put UNA now for the urine sodium. So the urine sodium is high and the urine sodium is low. This is a renal loss, my friends. So they're losing their sodium from their kidneys. 
And in this situation, they're losing the sodium from some other source, their skin, from their bloodstream. They're also losing it from maybe things like their GIT, vomiting, diarrhea, or the third spacing for pancreatitis, or very poor MPO intake. So in this particular situation, this would be a renal loss. So then you gotta start looking. Are they taking any diuretics? Are they taking loops, thiazides? Have they also have any issues with aldosterone? Maybe check an aldosterone level. See if they have any kind of problems with aldosterone production. Or did they have a subarachnoid hemorrhage that would suggest cerebral salt wasting? Urine sodium is really important as well for this one because this would tell me this is an extra renal loss. There was one, and I don't want you guys to forget this though, there is one out of all of these extra renal losses that did actually cause some mild degree of sodium loss. And I don't want you guys to forget that one. So I'm gonna put it in this source, but I'm gonna put a little asterisk next to it that you guys don't forget it. It was the only one that actually did cause urine sodium to actually increase to compensate for the metabolic alkalosis. Do you guys remember which that was? Vomiting. So please don't forget that. That's the only one, the only one of the extra renal sources of volume loss, of sodium loss, that actually can cause a little bit of renal sodium to actually increase a little bit. So again, and this is because we'll put vomiting because they develop a high pH because they're vomiting out all their protons. And so they try to trigger their kidneys to do what again? Just so that you guys don't forget this, it's a little quick little one to remember. It tries to tell their kidneys to pee out lots of bicarb. But when you pee out lots of bicarb to bring the actual pH what? Back down, you also excrete what other molecule? So you excrete the bicarb, but you also excrete sodium. And so that's why their sodium will actually be just a little bit elevated. Okay, so that covers the volume depletion ones. Now, what if the volume is actually, the patient appears hypervolemic, and this is that one that I told you where it's a little bit kind of confusing. They use that terminology. What was that terminology I told you guys? They have a low effective arterial blood volume in this patient population, right? So in this situation, believe it or not, it's all kind of like history and utilizing other tests. In other words, does the patient have a history of heart failure? Do they have a history of cirrhosis? Is there a lot of albumin in their urine? A lot of the times you can check those things, but also, Check their urine sodium. What do you think their urine sodium would be? Well, their renin angiotensin aldosterone system is what? It's on. And so it's reabsorbing lots of sodium. So because of that, in this situation here, their urine sodium should be very low, okay? But again, use other tests. I'm gonna put these kind of like in an asterisk. So use your other ancillary tests to determine the other etiology of that. So for example, considering things such as what? Considering things like an echo, to determine CHF, considering things such as um, you know, LFTs, considering things such as a urine albumin for nephrotic syndrome, et cetera, okay? The next thing here is to check the patient, okay, what if their volume status appears normal? So they are euvolemic. If they are euvolemic, this is a really difficult one to determine, right? So here's how we go about this. We try to figure out these first. We check the urine sodium, this will help us out a little bit to these degrees. Here's the next thing I do. I don't worry about the urine sodium just yet. You can check the urine sodium, and the urine sodium theoretically, again, it can vary from textbook to textbook. In a perfect world, the urine sodium should be on the higher end for these patients. But that's not the super, help, super helpful tip. What I like to do is I like to rule out the endocrinopathies first and then come to the last exclusionary diagnosis, which is SIADH. So what I like to do is if the volume appears normal and all these other things have kind of gone through, then what I do is I go to the next test. And I check two things. I check my thyroid function tests and I check my cortisol level. And the reason why is from here, I can get a two arm thing. If the TFTs are abnormal, okay, so let's say that this is the problem, so that the patient has TFTs that are consistent with low T3 and low T4, I have my diagnosis, hypothyroidism. If my cortisol comes back super low, very, very low cortisol level, boom, I have my diagnosis, cortisol insufficiency. But if the TFTs come back normal and the cortisol comes back normal, normal, and the uh, cortisol comes back normal, and I've ruled out that it's not a hypervolemic cause, it's not a volume depletion cause, then what I can do is I can go ahead and I can see if it's SIADH. So then I think, okay, okay, maybe this is SIADH. Is it SIADH? Well, then I gotta figure out what's the cause of the SIADH.
And so oftentimes it's looking through their medication history, but oftentimes we have to do like a CT scan. We have to do a CT of the head, see if there's not an intracranial pathology, CT of the chest, make sure there's not a lung pathology, CT of the actual abdomen, and pelvis to make sure that there's not kind of any kind of like uh, colorectal cancer, renal cell carcinoma, anything that could be a malignancy source of this inappropriate ADH production. And that's how we would go through this and then use their history obviously. But I think that's the really, really big things to think about here. And once you've gotten to the point of, oh, this is SIADH, this is supposed to be blue, then you can kind of say, okay, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. I just got to figure out what's the source of the inappropriate ADH production. And then again, look for meds, look for intracranial pathologies, look for pulmonary pathologies, look for malignancies. That's the big thing to go about here. But again, if you really wanted to, you could also add an additional test here that in all of these circumstances, if you checked, a urine sodium in this patient population, what would you get? The urine sodium theoretically should be high. And again, this can vary from textbooks to textbooks. It's just the last thing that you would check. Urine sodium is way more helpful. Just remember, it's way more helpful for determining the hypovolemic cause of hyponatremia. Not as helpful in hypervolemia and not as helpful in the euvolemic seats. The last thing that I want to talk about is sometimes this will come up, which is there is a specific type of renal loss, which is very interesting, which can kind of look like SIADH. So there's a specific one here. I think it's important to remember, it's called cerebral salt wasting, and then you have SIADH. One of the big things I think that's also kind of beneficial, because sometimes these can come up and you're not sure which one it is. In cerebral salt wasting, what I like to do is, I like to check what's called a fractional excretion of uric acid. And then I like to check in SIADH, another test here, which is a fractional excretion of uric acid. Because oftentimes, these patients will kind of, their volume status may be slightly difficult to determine, but you know that they have hyponatremia, their urine osmolality is high, and then their urine sodiums are high, but you're not sure which one it is, SIADH, or cerebral salt wasting, because they both can have an intracranial pathology as a cause. If you track the fractional excretion of uric acid, and patients who are super, super volume depleted, their fractional excretion of uric acid is very high. So their BUN goes up. Whereas in patients of SIADH, their BUN often tends to be on the lower end. They're not as volume depleted, they're relatively normal volume. And so they tend to be on the lower end. And that's an important kind of thing to add here to kind of help you to differentiate SIADH from cerebral salt wasting. Okay, my friends, we have gone through the diagnostics, the pathophysiology, the etiology, all of these things. The last situation here is how do we treat them and what are the complications to watch out for? All right, my friends, so now we have a patient, they come in, right? Let's say that we don't even know the cause of the hyponatremia, but they come in, they have potentially a low sodium. And again, I want you to remember those numbers. Mild hyponatremia, 130 to 134. Right? Moderate, 120 to 129. And then less than 120 is a very severe hyponatremia. When a patient comes in with hyponatremia, sometimes if it's like a mild hyponatremia, sometimes even a moderate hyponatremia, they may have no symptoms. And that's really, really important to be able to differentiate. When you have a patient who comes in who is symptomatic and they also have a hyponatremia associated with it, that's an emergent type of thing that you need to think about. So what we need to talk about when it comes to how we emergently treat hyponatremia is three factors that are really determining the treatment of hyponatremia. One is the timing, one is if they're symptomatic, and one is the degree of hyponatremia, with the most important factor being the timing and the symptoms. So let's say the patient comes in, they have hyponatremia. The first thing that you need to be able to discern is the timing. Is this acute? Or is it chronic? That's extremely important, my friends. So the reason why I, I think that's important is, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is that patients who have chronic hyponatremia, uh, they're at high risk of something called uh, osmotic demyelination syndrome, which we'll talk about. But we want to determine, is it acute or is it chronic? So how do we determine that time frame? So acute hyponatremia means that it has occurred in less than 48 hours. Therefore, patients with chronic hyponatremia meaning that if we look through their history, they've had hyponatremia for more than 48 hours. They live with this. This is their daily life. That's a really, really important point, and I will explain why a little bit later. But that's the first thing. So whenever a patient needs emergent hyponatremia therapy, 
oftentimes we prefer that it is an acute hyponatremia. It's developed within less than 48 hours. I'll explain why later. Patients who have chronic hyponatremia that maybe live with this daily, they already have compensated. They've developed a compensatory mechanism in their brain to actually compensate for that. And if you try to treat them and push their sodium up too quickly, you can cause something called osmotic demyelination syndrome. So preferably, we want the patient to have acute hyponatremia, sodium dropped to a particular level in less than 48 hours. The next thing is symptoms, and we'll talk about this one a little bit later, but the, the pathophysiological process by which symptomatology occurs is very interesting. Let's actually just hit it now. So here we have sodium molecules, right? So we'll have some sodium molecules here. And then over here, we're gonna have some water molecules. When a patient develops hyponatremia, you know there's water in two components. You're gonna have water in your extra intracellular component, and you're gonna have water in the extracellular component, right? Let's say that you have very little sodium. So the sodium level in the blood is very low. Sodium has the ability to control the movement of water. It controls osmotic gradients. But if the sodium is very, very low, is the water gonna to wanna to stay near the areas of low sodium, or would it want to move into the cells where maybe there's lots of glucose, or maybe there's higher amounts of sodium here, or maybe there's higher amounts of potassium here, things of that nature, things that actually can generate an osmotic gradient, there's more of these solutes that are present here in comparison to the amount of solutes in the blood. Well, where would water wanna move? If we use this kind of concept here where the solute concentration is lower in this compartment and the solute concentration is higher in this compartment, we know via the process of osmosis which way water would want to move. It's going to want to move to things of higher solute concentration. So the water will start flushing out of the blood and into the interstitial fluid and cellular compartment. And what's going to happen to these dang cells? They're going to swell like a moth. Like they're going to swell. And so you develop cell swelling. And this is super, super critical because this happens in very specific areas of the body where sometimes whenever cells start to swell, there's a lot of bone around that particular tissue that doesn't allow for it to swell very much. And this causes problems. One of these things is, let's say, inside of the skull. You know something called the Monroe Kelly Doctrine? And the Monroe Kelly Doctrine says that you have a, the, the cranium kind of inside of here, the, it's in a fixed space. You have this bone and then inside there's blood, there's brain tissue, and then there's cerebral spinal fluid. If you increase the amount of brain tissue, it's going to swell and it's in a fixed space. It's not gonna be able to move. And so the pressure inside of the skull cavity is going to increase. And that's one of the fearful complications. So one of the fearful complications here is that as you have a lot of this cell swelling, it causes an increase in the intracranial pressure. So lots of swelling means that this actual area, let's kind of represent this here. Let's say that a patient has lots of swelling now in their brain, lots of fluid within the brain that is gonna cause the brain to swell. Now the pressure inside of the cranium is going to increase. Patients with high intracranial pressure can develop a lot of problems. They may kind of manifest with headaches. They may manifest with nausea, vomiting. They may manifest with an altered mental status. They may start developing kind of like focal deficits or they can progress to the point of herniation. And herniation syndromes are beyond the scope of this lecture, but obviously with herniations, they maybe start having pupillary changes, maybe weaknesses, maybe they start having respiratory irregularities, a lot of different problems. So this is a scary, scary one with the most fearful one being herniation syndromes, okay? But again, one of the more common features here is the patient's gonna develop headache, nausea, vomiting, altered mental status, focal deficits, or herniation. So look for that, okay? Now, <clears throat> that's one particular etiology. The other one here is, sometimes when you cause cellular swelling, right? When you cause cellular swelling, it can actually cause dysfunction of some of these cortical neurons. And so what happens is you may develop kind of this irritable focus. So now, if you're causing all this cellular swelling here, let's say you're causing swelling in the brain, all this cellular swelling, it may become a focus of irritability within the brain. And then, this irritable part of the brain starts developing electrical excitability. And this electrical excitability leads to increased firing of neurons. And this increases the risk of seizures. These are the things that I actually completely fear of. And you know what else is really important here? 
High intracranial pressure is actually more concerning. So let's say that a patient has the cerebral edema. It's actually more concerning, even more fearful. If a patient is, and I don't mean to be rude, I'm not, I'm not this is literally evidence, uh, premenopausal women, they're more at risk because their brain is actually going to be more likely to swell. So if you're premenopausal women, or another potential thing is you have some type of brain substrate. And what do I mean? So you already have a stroke, you already have a bleed, you already have an aneurysm, you already have a tumor. So there's something there and then you increase the actual intracranial pressure by causing more edema. Because again, it's gonna cause, it's gonna cause cerebral edema. And the edema that you generate is what actually increases the intracranial pressure, which can cause these problems. If a patient already has a premenopausal or they have a brain substrate, in other words, they have a CVA, they have an intracranial hemorrhage, they have a mass, and then on top of that you had cerebral edema, oh my gosh, they're, they're likely gonna herniate. In the same situation here, because the cerebral edema can occur, cerebral edema can cause seizures. And the seizures are at higher, you have patients who are higher risk. Because what happens is, if you have a history of epilepsy and you drop the patient's sodium, that will increase the risk of seizures. So on top of that, if the patient has a history of epilepsy and they have cerebral edema, boom, they're at risk for seizures. So what I like you guys to think about is, what's the development, the timing? Is it acute hyponatremia? Oh, okay, if it is, that's really scary. Second thing, symptoms. Are they having any features of cell swelling or cerebral edema? In other words, they have any headache, nausea, vomiting, any types of uh, altered mental status, or any herniation syndromes that are developing. And even more worrisome that would actually urge therapy is are they premenopausal? Do they have something in their brain that's already increasing the pressure even more? Second, they start seizing. If they start seizing and they have a history of epilepsy, that's a really scary situation because hyponatremia will increase, uh, actually uh, cause more seizures, it actually lowers the seizure threshold, okay? So that's the big things to think about. Symptomatology. So acute, symptomatic, with the most worrisome symptoms, if I wanted to add this here, is going to be increased intracranial pressure or seizures. The second thing is, how low is the sodium? How low is the sodium? So in other words, is this, this is gonna go back to that, this, son of a gun, that's gonna go back to this discussion here, which is, is it mild? Is it moderate or is it severe? Oftentimes, if a patient has a mild hyponatremia, so in other words, mild, moderate, severe, we can determine this based upon numbers. Is it 130 to 134? That's pretty mild. I'm not gonna really be too aggressive about treating that one. So I wouldn't really treat that one. Moderate, if it's 120 to 129, I would consider that one. But the most concerning one that I need to act on is severe, especially if it's less than 120. Because usually at the point where the patients get a sodium of less than 120 is when they start seeing this cell swelling effect. And especially if it's acute, you need to get on that. All right, so I think the really, really important thing here is that patients who have hyponatremia that come in less than 48 hours with symptoms of high intracranial pressure like herniation or symptoms of seizures, and this is again a sodium that's very low, less than 120, I need to emergently administer particular therapy. So the question is, is what is that therapy? Let's talk about that. All right, so patient comes in, right? Just less than 48 hours ago, they started seizing, right? Come in, get their sodium, it's less than 120 says 118, right? When that happens, they now fulfilled at least three criteria. They're acute, they're symptomatic, and their sodium is very severe. If that's the case, how do I start treating these patients emergently? Well, here's the thing. My cells are swollen. Here's my cells. You see how swollen these suckers are? Look at them, big and swole, like, you know, just big old suckers. So if that's the case, what I wanna do is, I want to try to generate a pool of water, because before the water got sucked into the cells, because there wasn't enough tonicity, enough sodium within the bloodstream to keep the water in the bloodstream. Well, what if I increase the tonicity of the blood? So one of the ways that I can do this is I'm going to increase the tonicity. And the way that I can do that is I can give the patient salt. If I give the patient salt, how I'm going to do this is I'm gonna administer something called 
hypertonic saline. And oftentimes we do this as boluses. And so what I'll do is, if a patient comes in with acute, symptomatic, severe hyponatremia, what I'm gonna do is, and I'm gonna start off by giving them what's called 3% hypertonic saline. And I'm gonna do it as a bolus therapy, meaning I'm, I'm gonna push this. You don't slam the whole thing in, no, 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 no. You push it in like maybe over five, 10 minutes. And so what you'll do is you'll start off with 100 milliliters and you'll give them that bolus and see if they improve, if they stop seizing, if they stop kind of developing headaches, nausea, vomiting, altered mental status, or risk of herniation. If that doesn't work, you can do that three times with a max of obviously 300 milliliters, okay, of hypertonic saline. Now, when I increase the tonicity, what am I doing? I'm using this hypertonic saline to increase the amount of sodium that's present in the bloodstream. And if I increase the amount of sodium into the bloodstream, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna increase my sodium, so my sodium will increase. But also, I'm going to yank all of the water molecules, or some of the water molecules, that's present in these cells out, and get some of the water to come out of these cells back into the bloodstream. And if I decrease the swelling, I decrease the symptoms. In other words, I lower the intracranial pressure or I decrease the seizures or cease the seizures. You guys get that? That's a pretty cool concept, right? So that's how we would generally do this, is we would give the patient hypertonic saline to increase the tonicity of the blood and pull some of the water out of the cells. At the same time, we're improving the sodium. So we're fixing two things. We're increasing the sodium back to a normal level, and we're also <clears throat> reducing the cellular swelling. And that's the, pretty much the big thing. That's why symptomatology is actually the most concerning feature. If they have symptoms, that's the most concerning feature. Now, after we've done this, here's the problem. Sometimes, Sometimes you'll do the bolus therapy, and then you may, plus or minus, do what's called a hypertonic saline infusion. So you may continue to administer, you may continue to administer hypertonic, so 3% hypertonic saline for a while. So that's again gonna do what? That's going to increase the patient's sodium. There's something called overcorrection. And again, what happens with this is whenever you increase the sodium too quickly over a 24 hour period, if you increase it too quickly, and how quickly? Generally we say if you get greater than eight milli equivalents in 24 hours, it increased the risk of something called osmotic demyelination syndrome. I will talk about this a little bit later. I just want you to understand this for right now. So yes, I want to increase the sodium acutely because the patient is seizing. I gotta get their sodium up. So oftentimes, what I like to do and what most evidence supports is when you do this hypertonic saline, you're giving them the 3% hypertonic saline and you're trying to increase their sodium at least six milli equivalents per liter in six hours. And then what I do is I have like maybe two more milli equivalents I can bump up with an infusion if I need to but I don't wanna go over eight in a 24 hour period. Sometimes what may happen, and you don't mean to do this, but you give them the hypertonic saline and you push their sodium up, let's say 16 milli equivalents. And you're like, oh my gosh, if I go over eight, I can develop this concerning thing called osmotic demyelination syndrome. Well, how do I prevent that from happening? I gotta stop the patient from seizing or stop them from herniating by giving them hypertonic therapy, but I don't wanna go too fast because if I go too fast over a 24 hour period, I'm gonna demyelinate their neurons in the pons. Well, how do I prevent myself from overcorrecting over a 24 hour period? That's where we use something to decrease over correction. And there's two therapies. I um, tend to be very fond of one, um, but there's another one that you can utilize. So here's the thing, you're giving them a lot of sodium, right? What do we know about ADH? It turns on water reabsorption across the kidneys. Well, what if I, what if I had them, or it caused you to become thirsty and drink more water? What if I just push a lot of water down their GIT? Because often these patients are altered, they're herniated and they're seizing, they can't drink water. So sometimes you have to put an NG tube in and then give them water. So I can actually give them water. Well, that's one thing I'll do, because if I increase the amount of water, I will dilute down their sodium. So one of the things I can do here is I can try to increase their water. So I'm gonna, so in order to over, prevent overcorrection, I need to increase the water. I need to try to get more water in to bring the sodium down a little bit. 
So what I'm going to do is, the way that I'm going to do this, is I'm actually going to do this in two ways. One is I can actually give them free water. You can do this two ways. You can do it PO, so I'm literally pushing free water down their gut. Or I can do it IV, so D5W oftentimes is the way we can do this. So we're giving them free water, whether it be via IV or whether it be them drinking that, but I'm trying to get more water to move across their GIT into the bloodstream or through this bag of free water into their bloodstream to increase their water. And the reason why is if I increase their water, I will help to decrease their sodium a little bit. Now you're like, Zach, wait, I was trying to increase my sodium because the hyponatremia was causing them to have high ICPs and seizures. Yes, but I just want to get the sodium down to where I don't go greater than eight in 24 hours. I don't want to break that eight milliequivalent range in 24 hours because there's risk of negative outcome, such as osmotic demonation syndrome. So I'm using water to help to prevent the overcorrection. So in other words, I give them, I, I give them hypertonic saline, I push it up to 16 milliequivalents. Well, I got maybe a little bit less than 24 hours to give them free water, whether it be PO or, or free water within IV, to get that down eight milliequivalents so that I don't go over eight in a 24 hour period. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so again, an example is, I give them hypertonic saline, I push it up to 16, so I increased it 16, so the sodium went up 16. Well now I gotta give free water to decrease the actual sodium eight amount. So in other words, let's say I came in with, um, I don't know, 120, right? Or let's say one, you know, 120 just to be easy, and I bumped it up 16, right? So I went, to, I went from 120 to 136, that's way too much. I gotta bring it down a little bit. So I'm gonna drop it down eight, and that'll bring me to like 128, and that's appropriate over a 24 hour period, because I won't cause osmotic demonization syndrome. But if I went from 120 to 136, Within a 24 hour period, high risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. Okay, that's one way. So one way I can do this is I can give them free water. I'm gonna put like a little thing here next to it. So one way I can do this is I can give them free water, whether it be PO or D5W. There's another way that's a little bit easier, okay? Another way that I find a little bit easier and I find it to be a little bit cleaner. And the second way is I can give them something that will actually cause ADH to be reabsorbed across their kidneys. And that is? ADH. In ADH, we give a very specific drug. So again, this drug is actually called desmopressin. So desmopressin. I want you guys to be aware that there's also the common abbreviation DDAVP. So we call this a DDAVP clamp. So you're giving them hypertonic saline. Okay, if you give them the bolus therapy first, try to get it up six within at least the first six hours so they stop steezing and they don't herniate. Then keep checking their sodium levels. You gotta check this thing almost like every two to four hours. Cause you don't want it to break eight in a 24 hour period cause they have a risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. So while you're checking their sodium every two to four hours, you're giving them free water, PO or D5W in an IV to bring their actual water amount up and bring their sodium down so that you don't overcorrect. Another way that you can do this is you can continue to monitor BMPs. So again, it's really, really important, guys. Please remember this. BMPs, sometimes we do them like every four hours. Because if you, you push all this hypertonic ceiling, you check, ah, check the next day. You're, you're gonna cause a lot of problems. So check their BMPs to check their sodium very frequently to prevent overcorrection. One way that you can do that is free water. The other way you can do that is desmopressin, DDHP. I find this to be a little bit more elegant. And the reason why is, this is ADH, right? ADH, it's gonna bind onto the V2 receptor. If it binds onto the V2 receptor, what is it gonna do? It's gonna cause more water reabsorption. If I increase the amount of water reabsorption, what do I do to the amount of water within the bloodstream? I increase the amount of water within the bloodstream. If I increase the amount of water in the bloodstream, what am I gonna to do to my serum sodium? I'm gonna bring the serum sodium down. So I'm gonna bring the serum sodium down and that's gonna prevent overcorrection. So I want you to understand that you're often utilizing these two things in tandem. You're giving them a hypertonic saline bolus to get their sodium up. You can go up to six milliequivalents in six hours. Just for the love of goodness, don't go above eight in a 24 hour period. If you do, you risk this. I'll explain in a little bit. How do I prevent them from going over that in 24 hours? At this, after you give them the hypertonic saline to get them to stop seizing or herniating, check a BMP every four hours. Make sure that if that sodium is going up above the eight mil equivalent range, 
you give them free water or you give them desmopressin to bring it back down. Bring it back down just a little bit so that I can prevent them from going over the eight milli equivalent range in a 24 hour period, okay? So the whole concept is, as this example here, I give the patient hypertonic saline, I pump their sodium from 120 to 136. If I leave that go and I do a BMP the next morning and they're at 136, get ready for a lawsuit, okay? Because you're gonna cause osmotic demyelination syndrome. So what I gotta do is keep monitoring their BMP. Oh dang, I push it up 16. I gotta start giving them free water or desmopressin and get that down to what? Well, the max I can go is eight. So I gotta try to get that down, eight mil equivalents from that point. So that's where free water or desmopressin comes into play. You're utilizing these in tandem. All right, now that we've beaten this like a dead horse, let's now talk about what is osmotic demyelination syndrome and how do I prevent that? All right, guys, let's now talk about something called osmotic demyelination syndrome. This is really, really important to just, I wanna quickly go through this and I wanna spend a ton of time on it because it's, again, it's a small piece, it's a complication of treating hyponatremia, but it's something that you may experience on your exam. So whenever a patient comes in who has hyponatremia and you correct them too quickly, again, here's the thing, there's so many different numbers out there, there's a lot of numbers. Some, I think at one point in time, it used to be don't go over 12 mil equivalents within a 24 hour period. And then there was a lot of cases where they were saying, oh, well, we, we didn't, we were in the 10 to 12 range and we still caused an osmotic demyelination syndrome. And they said, okay, let's go less than 10. And then again, there were still cases between eight to 10. So I think there's been a lot of like support and a lot of like just logistical support and evidence and safety for the patient to stay within at least no more than eight mil equivalents per liter um, over a 24 hour period of that sodium increase. If you wanna to go to eight to 10, again, there has been some case reports that show that you do get osmotic demyelination syndrome, but oftentimes it's safe and some literature will actually support, again, an eight milli equivalent. Don't go greater than that. So <clears throat> at least at this kind of discussion, what is osmotic demyelination syndrome? How does it happen? And what are some things that I really have to be careful for besides overcorrecting them greater than eight milli equivalents within a 24 hour period? Well, first thing, osmotic demyelination syndrome is this really interesting kind of concept here. So let's say that a patient has hyponatremia, right? They have the hyponatremia, so they have very little sodium within their bloodstream. Um, and then let's say whatever the cause of it is, it doesn't really matter. Let's just say that they have hyponatremia, right? What we said is, as a result of this, they have less tonicity, less osmotic control to keep water inside of the bloodstream. Water moves into the cells and they swell. Then what you do is you give them hypertonic saline. When you give them hypertonic saline, what you do is, is you pump up their amount of sodium within the bloodstream. And now it's super osmolar there. So what does that do? If these are swollen cells, these cells are swollen, what is it gonna do? It's gonna pull water out of the cells. And then what happens is the cells will shrink and this can cause cell death. And particularly, this can actually cause maybe some of the oligodendrocytes within the ponds to die and then they demyelinate the axons within the ponds. And so what you actually start to experience here is in the ponds you start to develop this demyelination syndrome. So they also call, used to call this centropontine myelinolysis. Um, I think now it's kind of supported as osmotic demyelination syndrome. So osmotic demyelination syndrome is you demyelinate the pontine neurons. And the reason why is, is that you push the sodium up way too fast, or maybe not necessarily too fast, but you overcorrected the sodium over a 24 hour period. So you increase the sodium, what? Greater than eight milli equivalents over a 24 hour period. And that caused so much water to be yanked out of the cells that they shrunk. And again, as they shrink, some of the cells may die, especially the oligodendrocytes around the actual pontine neurons. Now, if that happens, there's so many different things that run through the ponds. This is not an anatomy course, but I want you guys to understand, there's obviously the corticospinal tracts, so they can actually develop you know, paralysis. There is the corticobulbar tracts, so they can develop different types of uh, speech problems, so they can actually develop like dysarthria, and they can even develop what else? maybe dysphagia, so dysarthria, dysphagia. It can even uh, hit the medial longitudinal fasciculus maybe, or the sixth nerve nucleus. And so this can even hit like maybe the medial longitudinal fasciculus or the sixth nerve. And this may even lead to some type of diplopia. 
So there's a lot of different things. And one of the worst case scenarios is if they hit the reticular formation. If you hit the reticular formation within the ponds, so you demyelinate some of the reticular formation neurons, let's actually write that one down. If you hit the reticular formation, this could lead to decreasing level of consciousness. Sometimes this can even put a patient to a locked in state. I'm not even kidding. So you want to be really, really careful of this kind of disease. So the whole concept with osmotic demyelination syndrome is that the patient has demyelination of the neurons within the pons that can cause destruction of the corticospinal tracts, causing paraplegia, quadriplegic. It can cause corticobulbar tract fibers to be affected. So maybe they have dysphagia, dysphonia, dysarthria, or it can hit some of the actual ocular fiber and motor neurons. I'm sorry. So the sixth nerve nucleus, maybe the medial longitudinal fasciculus causing diplopia and the other thing is that you actually can hit the reticular formation, causing like a decreasing level of consciousness. So it's really important to be able to understand these things. And usually the most common cause is an overcorrection of sodium greater than eight mil equivalents over a 24 hour period. But what are some other risk factors? So we know that it's overcorrection, but what are the people who are at highest risk? Because sometimes you can actually bump that sodium up and they may be okay. You don't want to play around with that, but what are the patient population that you really really have to be cautious of because they can overcorrect really easy. And I'll explain why. And they're at higher risk for this than other patients. One of them <coughs> is patients who have chronic hyponatremia. So chronic hyponatremia is a very important risk factor for osmotic demyelination syndrome. So greater than 48 hours of hyponatremia. They live with this. And oftentimes this patient population is this patient population, which I'm gonna mention. Patients who are cirrhotic, who are malnourished, and also, go, 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 alcoholics. So increase alcohol intake. Oftentimes, these patients all have chronic hyponatremia. They're a very common patient population. Now, I wanna explain really quick why these particular etiologies here can increase the risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. I'll save this last one for a second here. Here's why. Okay, here's a patient who is a cirrhotic, malnourished, alcoholic who has chronic hyponatremia, okay? If they have chronic hyponatremia, let's say that they develop hyponatremia. So here's their sodium molecules, here's their water molecules, and here's their cells, all right? What happens is when they develop, let's say, hyponatremia, so this is their first kind of inciting event of hyponatremia, they develop hyponatremia. What do we say happens to the water molecules? They can't stay here because there's not enough sodium. So where does the water molecules go? Well, they go into the cells and they cause the cells to swell, right? What happens is, <laughs> this is cool, these cells will then start pushing out molecules. So they, you, you cause these cells to swell. So they're, 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 they're swollen, they're all big, so these cells swell because of the initial hyponatremia. Water gets pulled into the cells, right? When the water is in the cells now and they're swollen, the cells start to compensate and they secrete out, let's see, let's put here this one, this blue molecule. They start to secrete something called little osmoles. This could be glutamine, this could be glucose, they could pump out potassium, they could pump out a lot of different molecules. But these molecules that they pump out are osmotically active. That's cool, right? Now, <clears throat> these I'm gonna call osmoles. So they pump out osmoles. This is the cell's own way of compensating. When they pump out osmoles, guess who likes to go out with the osmoles? The water. So they're like, oh wait, there's osmoles out here. I'm gonna move out of the cell. And so what happens is this has got a compensation mechanism. So now, look at what happens as these cells compensate. This is a auto, Compensation. Now, come here. The cells auto-compensate, so they shrink a little bit. Because why? Well, there was some water molecules in here that were there from the swelling, right? But now the water molecules got pulled out here. Why? Because the cell had pushed out these things called osmoles, little idiogenic osmoles. And it pulled some of the water out of the cells, and so they shrunk, right? So now they shrink. This is a way that they can protect themselves because this happens in the brain. So a patient who is a cirrhotic, malnourished, alcoholic, who has chronic hyponatremia, they end up having hyponatremia, their brain swells. When their brain swells a little bit, 
their brain cells produce osmoles that yank water out of those cells so that they shrink so that they don't suffer from herniation or seizures. Isn't that cool? It's, it sucks for the, for the patient because then their brain atrophies, but that's the effect. Now, you take this patient who's already, this, they're compensated, they are compensated. Now, hit them with the sodium. You increase their sodium with the hypertonic saline. You, don't over, you overcorrect them, big time. Now, look at this. You increase their amount of sodium now, <clears throat> drastically. They have some water in here. They have, they have some water here in these cells, right? And then you pumped all these like little idiogenic osmoles out here that were already out here that helped to pull some of the water in this point. Now, you increase the sodium even more. What are you gonna do to these poor cells here? Oh, poor cells are gonna yank more water more water, and they're gonna shrink even more than this one where they were compensated. So they were compensated here. You push their sodium up even more, their cells shrink and shrink and shrink. And so it increases the shrinkage. <laughs> Funny. Increase the shrinkage. And then what happens is the cells will start to die. And then you end up with osmotic demyelination syndrome. So the whole concept here is you have a patient who develops hyponatremia, they compensate by producing osmoles, yank water out of their own cells. Now they're compensated, you give them tons of sodium and you yank even more water out of those compensated cells, you cause the cells to die, oligodendrocytes in the ponds no longer demyelinate them, you end up with ODS, okay? Very important concept. And again, what is this sodium correction factor? Greater than eight milliequivalents per 24 hours. I can't say that enough, my friends. Please be aware that this number can, can actually change from textbook to textbook, though. This is the one that I found to be the most beneficial and the one that I use in my critical care um, kind of ex experience. Last one, hypokalemia. Hypokalemia, like, what? hypokalemia? If a patient has low potassium and you also, again, they have a high risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome, so I'm just going to add this there. High risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. Why? It doesn't have anything to do with this. It leads to this indirectly. Now watch this, this is really cool. You have a patient who's hypokalemic. Oftentimes, patients who are cirrhotic, malnourished, alcoholic, chronic hyponatremia, often have hypokalemia as well. But now, when you have hypokalemia, what's the thing? You gotta treat it. You're gonna treat that. And the treatment is to give them potassium. You gotta give them potassium. So you start giving potassium supplements or potassium IV, and then what happens is you push the potassium into the bloodstream. When you push the potassium into the bloodstream, there's these things called sodium potassium ATPases. These sodium potassium ATPases pump potassium into the cell, because right now your cells are just screaming. They're very hypokalemic. You're gonna pump tons and tons and tons of potassium in. If you pump tons and tons of potassium in, what are you gonna pump out? Sodium. Mm. And now the sodium in the bloodstream goes up. So when a patient has hypokalemia, and let's actually write like this, when they get hypokalemia, and then you try to replete their potassium, so you give them potassium, you stimulate the heck out of the sodium potassium ATPases and that causes a massive shift of sodium out of the cell as potassium is shifted into the cell to try to replete the low potassium. Now sodium goes up. So now take this example here, where you're giving, you have a patient who has hyponatremia, chronically, they compensate it, so now they're at this. You give them hypertonic saline and you give them potassium, you're gonna push their sodium up even more, shrink their cells, give them ODS and you're gonna be in a lawsuit, you're gonna be living on the side of the road. So you don't want that, right? So how do we prevent that? We take into consideration these factors, that this patient population tends to be the most at risk for hyponatremia. So be careful giving them hypertonic saline. Don't go greater than eight within a 24 hour period. So use your things like free water and desmopressin to prevent overcorrection. But again, these are the patient populations where you give them sodium, they will overcorrect, they're at high risk for ODS. And again, this patient population, if you're correcting them, 
and they have hypokalemia, very scary population. All right, my friends, that covers ODS. The last thing that I gotta talk about to finish this all off is, you have a patient comes in, hyponatremia, you found out that they were actually symptomatic, right? You treated their emergent symptomatic hyponatremia, you didn't give them ODS, but then you gotta prevent them from continually developing hyponatremia. So you have to treat the underlying cause. How do we do that? All right, my friends, so I think the really important thing to think about is if we have an emergent therapy of hyponatremia, we know what's the patient population. They're acute, they're symptomatic, and they have a sodium that's really, really low, less than 120. We already talked about the therapies of that with the 3% hypertonic saline, preventing overcorrection with free water and desmopressin, watching out for ODS. We know that. If a patient doesn't qualify for maybe emergent therapy, or maybe they were treated with emergent therapy, and we haven't had the chance to actually kind of like maybe send off some tests and figure out what was the cause of their hyponatremia. Well, once we figure out the cause of their hyponatremia, the most important thing is actually treating the cause. <laughs> so if a patient has hyponatremia, the first thing is to think about is they hypovolemic, hypervolemic, or euvolemic. Because at this point we would have gone through, let's say we went through everything. We used the serum osmos, we used the urine osmos, we used the uh, urine sodium, and uh, again, we delineated if it was hypovolemic from renal, extra renal, we determined if they were hypervolemic, we determined if they had SIADH, whatever. It's important to be able to know how we would treat that. And this is very simple. This is all I want you guys, I don't want to make this too hard. If the patient is volume down, they're hypovolemic, give them back the volume. They were losing what? In hypovolemia, what were you losing a lot of? Salt and water. So in this patient population, they were lost, they had a lot of sodium greater than water loss. So I want to give them back sodium and water because right now their total body water is low and their total body sodium is even lower. So how do I do that? I'm going to give them a solution of, this is really the only time I like to use this dang fluid, but normal saline. So 0.9% sodium chloride solution, normal saline may be a potentially beneficial fluid in this particular scenario. So maybe consider giving them some IV fluids. So IV fluids, sometimes, likely the more commonly utilized one is 0%, uh, normal saline, sodium chloride, okay? Now, once you do that, you're gonna be giving them sodium. You're gonna be doing what? At this point, they were depleted of sodium and they were depleted of water. You're gonna be giving them back sodium and you're gonna be giving them back water. So you're trying to replete the problem and then obviously treat the underlying issue. It was a diuretic, discontinue the diuretics or decrease the dose. It was cerebral salt wasting. This is the only other one that I gotta add in here. If it was a low aldosterone cause, in other words, it was due to cerebral salt wasting or it was due to um, Addison's disease, how do we treat that? In these, we give them a particular drug that is going to replace that. What's that drug? Fludrocortisone. Fludrocortisone. So you can give this in situations such as cerebral salt wasting or what else? What else? Addison's, because it's basically gonna give them back the aldosterone and help to retain more sodium, excrete some type of potassium, and then help to be able to keep in some water. So generally, we'll give them IV fluids, 0.9% sodium chloride, treat the underlying cause. If it's diuretics, discontinue them. If it's low aldosterone, give them fludrocortisone. If it's vomiting, get them to stop vomiting. If it's diarrhea, get them to stop, you know, Hershey squirts. Uh, treat all of those particular issues. And then after you've done that, again, that should help to resolve the hyponatremia. So it's very, very important. Oftentimes, IV fluids is going to be the answer that you want to remember on the exam. If you get a little bit of a tricky question, add on with low aldosterone, fludrocortisone. That's usually gonna be the way that they'll actually ask you on the test. Again, same thing, I can't stress this enough. If you're giving them some type of sodium, please monitor these patients continuously though with BMPs to make sure that they don't develop greater than eight milliequivalent per 24 hour increase in sodium that causes osmotic demyelination syndrome. You still monitor for it. All right, in this patient population, their volume up. So they're hypervolemic. This is your CHF patient. This is your cirrhosis patient. This is your nephrotic syndrome patient. Most common one out of all those, CHF. And these patients, their problem is, is their total body sodium is elevated. But what's even more elevated? Their total body water. So I do not need to give these guys any IV fluids. I do not need to give them any sodium <laughs> because they already have high sodium and they already have lots of free water.
well, what if I got rid of the free water or I actually restricted them from taking any free water in? That may be beneficial. I'm gonna try that. So one of the first things I'm gonna do is I'm going to fluid restrict my patient. That could be really challenging because sometimes you gotta keep that to like less than like 1.5 liters per day. Could you imagine drinking like less than that every single day? It could be super, super difficult to do that. But oftentimes that's what we'll actually try first. Because if I actually restrict the amount of water intake that this patient is getting in, then I can actually reduce the amount of free water that's actually in the blood that's causing their hyponatremia. Now, oftentimes fluid restriction won't work, okay? And if they fail or if their sodium is really bad, it's really low and there's no way that you're able to get that sodium to come up enough with fluid restriction, we may try something else. And this is what I like to do. What I like to do is I like to cause the kidney to maybe excrete free water, excrete a lot of free water into the urine and maybe even some sodium because I got a lot of sodium here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cause the excretion. I'm gonna to try to excrete free water to the best of my ability. Well, how do I do that? Well, there's three drugs. One is I can give something called a loop diuretic. Do not give a thiazide diuretic. You'll actually drop their sodium even more. But a loop diuretic will do what? It'll inhibit the sodium, potassium, two chloride co-transporters, and I will not reabsorb sodium. But on top of that, I won't pull water via the countercurrent multiplier mechanism. So we know that what I'm gonna get a lot of in here is I'm gonna get a lot of, I'll get some degree of sodium, but I'm gonna get rid of a lot of water. Loop diuretics cause way more water loss than sodium loss, way more. So if you look at loop diuretics, they're gonna cause more water loss than they will sodium loss. Thiazide diuretics cause more sodium loss than water loss. So it's really important to remember that. So that's one way, I can get rid of a lot of the free water. And if I decrease the amount of free water, that will help to again, allow for my sodium to start coming up. Because again, I'm getting rid of some of the free water. So I'm gonna fluid restrict them, maybe even consider giving them a loop diuretic. There's another one. Another one that I could do, so that's one. The second thing I could do is I could give them what's called an ADH antagonist an ADH antagonist, and this is something like Tolvaptan. I'm not a big fan of the Vaptans, but they're decent if you have no other option or if they're refractory. So when you do this, what you, you know ADH loves to bind here and increase water reabsorption, right? Increase water reabsorption, but that would actually make things worse because you need to increase your free water. <laughs> what if I give a drug that actually blocks ADH from binding here? and then inhibits water reabsorption, and instead causes water to be lost in the urine. So you excrete a massive amount of free water. I'll decrease my free water. If I decrease my free water, then my total body water will come down and my actual total body sodium is a little bit higher. Boom, my sodium will come up. So that's another mechanism that I could utilize. So again, loop diuretics, ADH antagonists will cause you to excrete free water primarily free water. And then if you fluid restrict them, you prevent the amount of water that they're getting in, that'll also decrease your total body water. So the whole goal in this patient is to decrease the amount of total body water they have. In a hypovolemic patient, you wanna give them back sodium and water. A solution that has a little bit more sodium than water would be potentially beneficial. And then treat the underlying disease, and if it's a low aldosterone problem, give them aldosterone in the form of fludrocortisone. There is another drug that I, you can use in here, but it's not super commonly utilized. I'll talk about it down here with SIADH, and that's called urea. But let's actually come down to the last one here, which is SIADH. All right, my friends, the last one here is SIADH. So SIADH in this patient population, where I know hypovolemic is they have very low total body sodium and then low total body water, but less total body sodium. So we want to give them back sodium and water. So sodium chloride solutions are going to be the best. And then also fludrocortisone if they have low aldosterone. Patients with hypervolemic hyponatremia, they're having an excessive amount of total body water and an increase in their total body sodium. I wanna get rid of a lot of free water or restrict the amount of free water that's coming into the body. Oftentimes, free water restriction isn't enough. I have to excrete free water via loop diuretics or ADH antagonists in refractory cases. For SIADH, it's actually very similar to the hypervolemic patient. What we wanna do is in this patient here, is when you look at their sodium intake in comparison to their sodium uh, amount versus their water amount, 
they have a little bit of an increase in their total body water. And oftentimes their sodium tends to be pretty much like normal to slightly elevated, but I like to think about it just to make it easy. It's usually pretty much almost normal. So there's just maybe a little bit more water than there is sodium. So one of the things I can do is I can do the same thing like a hypervolemic patient. If it's too much total body water, I can have them restrict their amount of fluid intake. And that's the first thing that I'll do. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna try to restrict their free water intake. So restrict fluid intake. And I'll get that to like less than like, you know, one to 1.5 liters per day. Sometimes it's really difficult to meet this goal, but you can try it. If I do that, I decrease the amount of water that they're intaking and I kind of decrease their total body water. And that may help to be able to bring their sodium up. But if this fails, then what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to do two other things. Oftentimes in these patients, they sometimes need a combo of two particular drugs. I need to give them more sodium because if I'm restricting their fluid intake and it's not working, then the second thing that I need to do is, is I need to increase their salt intake. And you can do this in two ways. One is you can literally, I'm not even kidding, you can give them sodium chloride tablets, but oftentimes in these patients who have a very low sodium, we will use hypertonic saline infusions. Oftentimes the more common one is 3% hypertonic saline infusions. And what we're doing is, was we're gonna infuse in sodium. And that's gonna to help to increase the sodium because their sodium is kind of like normal. So I'm gonna to try to increase the amount of sodium that I'm giving them via salt tablets or hypertonic saline infusions. And what that's gonna do is, is it's gonna take the actual sodium and increase the sodium a little bit. And that may help the, uh, help the patient out but maybe it's not enough. I'm increasing their salt intake, but they still have a high water intake. Their total body water is still high. Well, I wanna get my sodium to go up and I want my total body water maybe to come down a little bit. So how do I do that? That's where I can attack the nephron. So the third thing that I can do, often in tandem with the salt intake, the third thing I can do is I can excrete free water. And how would I do that, my friends? One is I could give a loop diuretic. And this is often in combination with a hypertonic saline infusion. And so what you'll do is you'll give the loop diuretic and it'll inhibit the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter. You don't reabsorb sodium. Therefore, you don't pull water out of the descending limb. All the water gets lost. Lots of water gets lost into the urine. You're losing tons and tons of water <clears throat> in the urine. And what am I doing to my actual total body water? I'm decreasing my total body water. And by giving them salt tablets or hypertonic saline infusions, I'm increasing the sodium at the same time I'm excreting free water with a loop diuretic, right? So that's a pretty cool concept. Now, oftentimes, if the patient is refractory to restriction of fluid intake, increased sodium intake with salt tablets or hypertonic saline infusions, with a loop diuretic, usually has a combo between these two. Then the last thing is for the refractory, for the refractory SIADH, that's when we'll do the ADH antagonist. Same thing for the uh, hypervolemic patient here. Often they usually respond to a loop diuretic um, and then again, like less uh, fluid restriction, more fluid restriction. But a refractory SIADH patient, sometimes they may require an ADH antagonist. And again, that's going to massively cause a lot of free water excretion. I just think it's really, really important to remember that if you're giving an ADH antagonist or you're giving a lube diuretic and a hypertonic saline infusion, really monitor that sodium. Okay, BMPs every like four hours, I think are kind of beneficial to make sure that you don't overcorrect them over that 24 hour period as well. But that's the things I would utilize. So restrict fluid intake, increase salt intake, and again, cause excretion of free water. There's one last thing that can excrete free water. It's kind of like a plus or minus. I'm just gonna add it in. I actually kind of just recently started using it and I really like it. It's oral urea. And so what I use this instead of, is I find it to be a little bit elegant. So it's an alternative to the loop diuretic and hypertonic saline combo. 
I feel I find it to be very cool. So what urea is is it's a it's a solute molecule. It's an osmolar kind of molecule. So you take it orally, it gets across the GIT, and what it does is it gets filtered across the kidney tubules. And as it gets filtered across the kidney tubules, what it does is it creates an osmotic gradient that pulls water with it. So it'll get peed out into the urine, right? And what it'll do with it is it'll pull lots of water along with it. So it'll yank water along with it into the urine. And so it'll really cause a lot of free water intake. I mean, free water excretion, I apologize. So sometimes oral urea is a good alternative to a loop diuretic and a hypertonic saline infusion combo. These are usually very commonly utilized in tandem, very commonly utilized. I just find them to be sometimes a little bit uh, kind of difficult to manage. So I like to give the oral urea, usually a 15 or 30 gram uh, oral urea, and find that it's really beneficial and just easier um, to be able to cause excretion of free water. So to excrete free water, because it'll act like an osmolar molecule and yank water out into the urine. And so that's kind of a nice alternative. I don't have to kind of do a combo between these two drugs. But my friends, that would cover hyponatremia. We've talked about a massive amount in this Avengers level movie. I really hope that it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Love you, thank you, and as always, until next time. Thank you.